Okay, we are live. Welcome everybody to another Duran Live. We have Alexander McCurs in London, and we have the man that brings thousands upon thousands of viewers, breaks viewership records when he appears on our live streams, the one and only Mr. Robert Barnes. Robert, how are you doing? Where can people find you? Uh, good, good. Uh, people can find uh, all of the content and uh, from everywhere across the web and uh, uh, exclusive content at vivabarneslaw.locals.com. All right. Let's say a quick hello to everyone that is watching us on Rockfin, Odyssey, Rumble, and the Duran.locals.com. Though on the Duran.locals.com, we are having an issue with the chat, not the actual uh, feed of the video, but the chat seems to be uh, oh. not working. So I'm going to be troubleshooting that as uh, as we get this live going. So uh, I apologize for that, and I will be trying to fix it. But let's begin with uh, with this live stream. We have a lot to talk oh. about. From the Twitter oh. files to a Trump indictment oh. to Ukraine and oh, yeah. everything else that is yeah, going Election on. contest this week in Arizona over Arizona. the Arizona governor's race. Carry um, yeah. And there might be oh. forthcoming news on the speaker issue. So uh, uh, we might start there. The uh, I talked to some folks in Trump camp yesterday. The So the Speaker of the House, as we talked about last time, establishment to kind of moot its populist uh, oriented audience uh, or uh, candidates. And so in, in, the, in the process of doing so, they ended up losing key house seats that left the Kevin McCarthy with a very small and thin majority. And there's enough votes to stop him from becoming speaker. Now, there's no votes to make somebody else speaker. So uh, increasingly, uh, Trump had decided to stick with McCarthy because he viewed McCarthy as better than the unknown alternative. Uh, and uh, however, it's become clear that there are at least five members of the Republican caucus who will not vote for McCarthy. Uh, that means that there would be no speaker come January. And, and then you've got very shenanigans by Democrats trying to talk about putting Liz Cheney in as speaker. This is all because the speaker of the House in America does not have to be elected to the House of Representatives. It can be literally any citizen. And so the there had been talk by Steve Bannon going back a couple of years of making Trump speaker of the House. Trump said he wasn't interested, made it clear. However, because of the unusual circumstances currently pending, uh, people in the Trump camp uh, are urging him to offer a compromise, which is that Trump would become a Speaker of the House for 100 days. So not for two years, but for 100 days while Republicans work out their leadership issues to avoid the scenario where Republicans have no Speaker of the House come January. Um, I, you know, I and some others have encouraged Trump to take that path for many reasons. One, it's better than having no Speaker of the House. Second, it's better than having Liz Cheney or some Democrat somehow snook her in, which would be a complete embarrassment for the Republican Party. Uh, there are things Kevin McCarthy, frankly, needs to improve upon that he hasn't yet accepted. This would give him the opportunity to do so. Uh, at Trump, it would be Trump versus Biden for the first hundred days of the House. It'll definitely attract news and drama, and it gives Trump a platform to be on the policy significant side of the equation. Because even though he made a very big, big tech proposal last week, that was overshadowed in part by his uh, NFT trading cards. And the uh, you know, it was classic Trump. People forget that the man loves to make money. He's in that business as much as he's in any business. Uh, but there was even a good part of his base that was not happy with him choosing to announce that as his first policy announcement rather than the big tech proposal. So uh, a lot of those folks would, so this would put him in the more serious role. Speaker of the House, the media would have to deal with him. The media would have to cover him on a daily basis. Uh, he would be the leader of the Republican effort for the first hundred days. Biden maybe ha would have to meet with him. I mean, it, it would, it would, it would send the Democrats in a total tizzy. The media would be uh, off the rails. And it would rally the Republican base at a key time when they need it. And it would show Trump helping out the party at a key juncture that would restore some confidence in some of the people that are wavering on the Republican uh, institutional side of the political mm -hmm. equation. 
with all the media pushing for DeSantis or somebody else to challenge him or contest him. And I was suggesting he do things like, if he's Speaker of the House for 100 days, propose that he go over to Ukraine and cut a peace deal, right? Is uh, Would, would, would uh, Ukraine say no to Trump visiting? Uh, how would they handle that? The Speaker of the House, all of a sudden, they want, they want billions of dollars more, 50 billion plus. Um, and they're not willing to let the Speaker of the House come over there. Uh, I mean, he could disrupt all kinds of institutional establishment objectives while rallying the base, while serving the party, uh, while helping himself all in one clean boot. And so uh, don't be surprised if over the next week uh, or weeks before the the speaker vote, uh, if you start to see Trump take it. Uh, Apparently, Trump has told some folks he's willing, he's entertaining the idea. He previously said, no, not interested at all. He's now, as he thinks through his options, he's now increasingly thinking, hey, why not? And he could add Speaker of the House to the Trump famous resume. So uh, it that would be a fun curveball in the new year that could really disrupt the establishment objectives if that comes about. And it has a much better chance of coming about than people currently know. My goodness. Well, all I can say about that, Robert, is if it happens, it will not just be fun. It will just be absolutely astonishing fun. I I am just longing to see the expressions of people in Europe, um, in Britain, in the European Union, if their old enemy, their old nemesis, Donald Trump, is back as Speaker of the House, they will go into absolute meltdown. I just can't imagine the reaction. At the moment, the, the mood in Europe is that Trump is down and almost out, that he's going to be indicted very soon. They really believe that. They really hope it's going to happen. They're looking forward to the prosecution. They think he's the midterms are bad for him. So, I mean, if he suddenly comes out, you know, becomes on, this is on the 3rd of January, I think, it's the new Congress meets. If he becomes Speaker of the House, I mean, it will just be, it will be such fun to watch. I mean, just for the joy of seeing the reaction of these people, these awful people, I would be delighted to see it happen. Absolutely. And he could do things like uh, shut down the uh, government by not approving a budget, by leading that effort uh, over the uh, over the borders, over the issue about open borders. The He could uh, appoint committee uh, people to chair committees to investigate Biden. Uh, and not limit the scope of what that investigation is and put key people uh, like Marjorie Taylor Greene and Matt Gates and people like that in critical positions within those committees to meaningfully investigate. He could create his own version of a January 6th committee. Uh, Pelosi already established the Speaker of the House. Can you unilaterally do that? She might regret having made that perilous precedent last cycle. Uh, he might have his own ideas. Maybe we should have a whole 2020 election review investigation. What does that look like, given that what we now know about his own Justice Department and uh, under Bill Barr, arguably the worst attorney general in history up there with Palmer and some others, uh, having led election interference at Twitter, as has been publicly disclosed over the past several weeks. Um, And then you have the election contest as an example of that pending in uh, Arizona that will go to trial this week. First, it may be the only video broadcast, live video broadcast. Uh, uh, Viva and I will cover the first day of the trial f- for sure, um, the, the day that Carrie Lake presents on, uh, I believe that'll be Thursday, is, uh, let me see. Oh, no, it's tomorrow, <laughs> Wednesday. So on Wednesday, there's going, uh, and Thursday, the two days scheduled for trial. For those that don't know uh, uh, how America's election contest process works, uh, of course, the United States, our, we don't have a national election contest process other than Congress voting on issues of federal officers. So they decide whether certain electoral electors count for the presidential election, as famously took place in, <laughs> on January 6th of 2021. Uh, but also they've done that multiple times in the past. Uh, going over, The most famous one being the uh, deal in 1876 cut to allow the Republicans to keep the presidency in exchange for withdrawing any support of African-Americans and others in the South uh, that allowed the Democrats to seize complete control and not only block black voters, but also get rid of a lot of poor white voters. Uh, Mississippi had fewer voters in 1900 than it did in 1860. 
And that isn't because there were a bunch of slaves voting in 1860. Uh, they got rid of about two thirds of poor whites too. Uh, but that deal was all cut by the 1876 deal. But uh, on uh, otherwise, all our elections are done at the state level. And the electoral contest, even for federal offices, are generally filed at the state level. Uh, and the way that not every state has an electoral contest statute, but a majority of states do. And the way that works is that within a certain compressed time frame, you have to bring a challenge and you have to show two things. Something happened that was uh, not lawful and that, uh, that resulted in votes being counted that should not have been counted or votes being excluded that should have been counted. So the, the vote count is wrong for some reason due to something illegal. Now, it doesn't have to be intentional. It doesn't have to be fraudulent. It just has to be illegal for any reason. And then the second part is that the total number of quote unquote illegal votes uh, or an illegal vote count is the better way I like to call it. In other words, because illegal vote count includes votes ex improperly excluded as well as votes improperly included is greater than the margin of victory. And you don't have to prove that to a certainty. You just have to bring it uh, to a sufficient doubt to warrant a remedy. And the most commonly issued remedy is a revote, uh, uh, just another a a vote. The In Arizona, a bunch of people brought challenges. The only one that's going forward that I know of as of now is Carrie Lakes. Uh, now, the, er the problem in America is our judges generally don't like to interfere in elections unless they're doing so for a politically favored class or constituency. So when Democrats sue, they usually sue in the name of African-American voting rights, young people, something like that. And the courts then jump to action because they don't want to be perceived as the 1950s American South. And so they'll often do things like change when early voting can occur, as happened in Georgia for Senator Warnock that got him reelected there in part, uh, gave him an extra day. And a weekend of just Democrats voting in Democratic counties, effectively. Uh, they, 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 you know, they'll, they'll extend you can vote up until 2 a.m. in Michigan, as took place in, 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 in Ann Arbor because of a judge taking action. Uh, you, you see a lot of those kind of remedies. Uh, similarly, if it's a establishment Republican, often you see uh, the courts happily intervene, uh, as they famously did for George W. Bush in 2000, the most famous court intervention in an election in American history. Um, however, if you're an outsider, and it doesn't matter which side of the outsider you're on, like, whether you're like the, the candidate you guys talked to that's up in New York that saw anomalies in what happened in her election trying to compete for the United States Senate, uh, whether you're talking about, I, I represented pretty much all of them at one time or another, uh, representing Ralph Nader, Jill Stein, Green Party, Peace and Freedom Party, Libertarian Party, Taxpayers Party, Tea Party, Constitution Party, independent candidates, you name it. Uh, the courts all of a sudden turn very hostile. You're here to impugn the great integrity of our great elections. How dare you? It's because of bad, it's because of fraudsters like your client and sleazy lawyers like you who are working for free in all these cases, typically, by the way, or on the cheap, uh, that, 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 uh, that the ordinary American has doubt about the great sanctity of our great elections. And in the name of the sanctity of the judiciary, they uphold the sanctity of the elections by denying election reform. That's typical response. In Carrie Lake's case, that partially happened. She challenged the signature matches, which just don't match in Arizona, on these massive mail-in ballots uh, to the degree that it far exceeds the number of uh, votes in the margin of victory, the judge won't allow her to present her evidence on that, saying that she, they, they brought a lot of doctrines that, you know, you, you would know Alexander is a British lawyer because they derive from old British law, all the, going back to the old king's conscience, the appeal of the king's conscience, the law of <laughs> equity. Uh, and they say latches uh, and mootness and stand. Well, the way I like to put it this way, most election contests, well, if you try to sue in the, in the spring, well, the case isn't ripe yet. Uh, so they say ripeness prohibits you from suing. If you try to sue in, in the summer, they say, ah, or the fall, ah, it's really kind of moot. It's already, the election's already scheduled, can't fix it now. And if you sue after the election, they say, latches, you should have sued so much sooner. Uh, there was an Arizona judge that actually said that the Secretary of State candidate brought an election contest, should have sued five years before he was even a candidate, before, before there was even an election before he was even thinking about running for public office, that he was so unreasonable in his delay, latches prohibit him from suing. These are laughable doctrines brought by Pontius Pilate judges 
looking for political pretext to uphold the mythology of free and fair elections rather than the sincerity of free and fair elections, while, while trying to pretend that they are governed by fact and law in, in promoting the myth of law in the process. This judge partially did that in the Carrie Lake case. Mm-hmm. Okay, won't let her bring a signature match check, but did allow her to bring the problem of ballot custody. Basically, there's big problems with the ballot chain of custody. This is what happens when you have mass mail-in ballots anyway, frankly. It invites chain of custody problems, and meaning that they don't know where exactly the ballot came from before they counted it. The short answer. So uh, that that is, of course, a problem because you don't know if you have if that's an accurate ballot or an inaccurate ballot that got counted. In addition, on Election Day, there was a massive outage of ballot printers and tabulators across the county, knowing it was re- when Republicans were going to be voting in mass uh, because of their objection to mail-in balloting that many of them currently have. And he's allowing that to go to trial. And the Cary Lake has expert testimony. My friend Richard Barris, People's Pundit, uh, did exit polling that he'd never seen results for before. That's how that's how they found out it was really bad on election day. He was doing exit polling, and he's like, I keep talking to people that are saying I can't vote. What, what the heck is going on? Um, so that issue of ballot suppre- voter suppression on the ballot printers, and they have an expert that said the only way that they could have such a mass outage is if somebody intentionally, deliberately did it, and it's one of the leading uh, election machine experts in America, worked for the United States Election Assistance Commission and others. Um, that's going to get to go to trial. The issue of the ballot chain of custody, which is going to out, out a company that has deep democratic ties, uh, which shouldn't be involved. We shouldn't be outsourcing our elections. Bad idea. Always invites trouble. My democratic friends understood this. My friend Robert Kennedy understood this in 2004 when he was part of the group challenging in Ohio, the Diebold system being involved when the Diebold voting machine system was big donors to the Bushes. Um, so the, so those issues are going to go to trial, and we're going to see the first ever election contest. Two to one day for Kerry Lake on Wednesday. The gov- the state gets to respond on Thursday. Judge will make a decision pretty quickly. I think the judge is a wuss, so I don't think the judge has the courage. He he, he said all these things about we have to uphold and presume and re- assume everything's right with the election, where he's misquoting the law. What the, the and when the irony is, he says we have to respect the will of the people. The point of an election contest is to figure out what the will of the people actually was, not to uphold bogus elections. Um, So uh, I don't think he has the courage to do what should be done legally, but at least we'll finally get an open, transparent process with a meaningful evidentiary hearing that the world will get to witness in live time that will provide it. That itself will provide some value in improving the quality of our elections over time. So it'll be uh, uh, it'll be something, again, first time I think it's ever been happened in America. I think, it's a, I think this is a breakthrough, actually, because nothing has been more frustrating, at least to me, than to see lots of challenges, especially in 2020. And I make no apology for talking about 2020 on this issue. Lots of challenges which should have been heard and should have been considered by the courts and the courts just ran away from them. Uh, it's a complete abdication of responsibility. As Robert correctly says, there's no um, electoral commission in America. You don't have that, uh, uh, a nationwide, uh, a federal level uh, uh, um, electoral commission because you don't have, you, your elections are in every place. There are in effect state elections. I mean, they happen according to the rules that happen there. But that means that places a particular responsibility or so it seems to me, on the courts, on the court system, to see that this process is done and conducted in a proper way, because there is no other check. There is no other machinery in in the United States for that. And perhaps if the courts are doing their job, there doesn't need to be. (laughs) But the courts have not been doing their job. And because they haven't been doing their job, these doubts, these concerns have been there and they are growing and they are going to continue to grow. When people talk about, you know, you are impugning the sanctity of our system, you're suggesting that this system is, you know, uh, this perfect system is less than perfect. No, that's wrong. That's a completely wrong way of looking at this. If people feel that they have serious and genuine concerns about what happened and they have no recourse 
there is no recourse to law. That is what is going to cause people to be concerned and angry and worried and ultimately disillusioned and distrustful of the system. I mean, that isn't something that ought to be, needs to be explained in a democracy. So it's wonderful that at last we have a court that is going to hear this. And can I say, I completely agree with you, Robert. Maybe the results will not be as we would like them to be. Maybe this judge is going to make a decision which we don't understand. I'm going to just say a few things, by the way. So, so there's legal doctrines that you mentioned. But maybe, maybe the judge will get this wrong. But at least it's an important stepping stone. It, it shows you can take this to court in America. The courts will look at it. You can argue about it over there. And maybe once you can get the ball rolling, eventually you will get a decision from the courts which will make sense. Because all those legal doctrines that you were talking about, can I just say, I mean, when you talk about leches in a case of, you know, an election case, I mean, I'm just absolutely stunned. Staggered, staggered. I'm flabbergasted. I mean, I, I, I don't want to get technical here, but to talk about equity in this kind of in this kind of situation. I mean, the, uh, um, e equity for those who you know. Uh, Robert talked about you know the king's conscience and all of that. Equity is a kind of it's it exists in the United States. It exists in Britain. Many of the best equity precedents, by the way, come from the United States. Americans are very, very big on equity, and they're very good at it. But the idea is you have the written law, but the written law, you modify it in order to achieve justice in certain situations. And it's a very conservative uh, um, parallel system, if you like, that affects and adapts the law. Um, and there are very tight rules. There's the famous maxims of equity, which, of course, Robert knows all about, you know, he who comes to equity must come with clean hands and all that. I'm not going to go into all the details of all of this. But Leitch's is the principle that if you are going to exercise an equitable remedy, you have to do it within a reasonable time. You can't wait years and years and years and then come along and say, you know, I want, you know, all this that was done to me all those years ago was unjust. To apply that to electoral law is nonsense. I mean, it's just, it's just a completely, um, I mean, it, it, it's absurd. I mean, I can't find words to describe how nonsensical it absolutely, it absolutely is. And it is exactly what Robert said. It's judges fishing around for doctrines, for things that they cobble together to give themselves a, a get out from making the kind of decisions which they must know they should be making. Because if you start arguing things like that, well, frankly, I mean, you can't really believe you can't really believe in them yourself. And I'm sorry. I mean, I just I just can't believe how, you know, however differently law is sometimes applied in, in America from the way it is in Britain, that it, any judge really believes that leches can possibly apply in a case about, you know, electoral, electoral mismanagement or call it, call it, call it ever, whatever you will. But let's, let's not get into all of that. The fact is we've got a case We've broken through this barrier of the court saying, no, no, no issue. We're not going to look into this. It's too late. It's too soon. It's whatever it is. They're finally looking into it. I'm a bit surprised that it's happened. It looks as if the accumulation of problems in Arizona was just too great to ignore. And we'll see what the judge has to say. And we'll take it from there. But as I said, it's a breakthrough. And I hope personally, that we do get a proper legal examination of all of this. And I'll be very interested to see what the judgment says. Robert, is there an appeal? Is 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 it possible to appeal this decision? Yeah, you, you get expedited appeals rights. So my own view is like some of these motions to dismiss that were brought should not have even been entertained. This was supposed to be a election contest are designed to be summary proceedings, mm -hmm. to be expedited proceedings. So you don't have a trial by jury, you have a trial by judge. But what's supposed to happen is you file your allegations, you get, uh, like, to give people an idea, in some states you have to file your entire election contest within five days of the certification of the election. That's pretty mm -hmm. typical. 
So you're put under a ridiculously compressed time frame mm. uh, by this. And this judge has made clear he wanted to afford, make a decision in sufficient time for them to appeal prior mm. to inauguration day. Now, in America, and actually in Arizona, there mm. is precedent for letting an election contest be litigated a whole year and then changing what happens in Arizona. That A guy got elected governor, was governor, was governor for almost a year, and the Arizona Supreme Court came and said, now, nah, you know what, he stole it. We're going to give it to the other guy. So there is precedent for that. And, in fact, we used to take these things much more seriously, old election contests. Jimmy Carter first got elected to office, challenging signatures, amongst other things, uh, in, in, a, in a race for, the, I think it was the state house, and he won his election contest and was declared the winner. So when I hear people say that this is an attack on democracy, this is overturning, uh, uh, I, I just, I find it laughable. I mean, it, especially from a Democratic, there's a guy that's a big election law guy or election expert, so-called, professor. I think it's Michael McDonald, if I got his name right, uh, from the I think, University of North Florida. Does a lot of great election data gathering. But I see him and other so-called democracy champions on the Democratic side of the aisle praising the effort of Congress currently to try to prohibit Trump from running for office under a misapplication of our 14th Amendment, which stems from the old Civil War, where we didn't want Confederates taking back over positions of office, which we actually solved and settled a few years later. And it was supposed to be dead. We resurrected it for World War I, where we tried to kick Victor Berger off. Well, we tried to put him in prison, too, uh, a lot, as we did Eugene B. Debs. That was the last time we had a lot of bad laws of this type being trying to be enforced, sedition laws included, as they were brought back, resurrected for the January 6th defendants as well now. But the, uh, but that, the idea is, how is it democracy to cheer on excluding the voters from voting for the candidate of their choice and your leading party opponent? How these people maintain, I mean, what they mean by democracy is the same thing the State Department and the EU means by democracy. Institutions infamously very anti-democratic. Mm. And what they mean by democracy is they mean they, the professional managerial class of a certain political stripe, rule the rest of us. That's why they kept saying Trump is a threat to democracy. They meant Trump is a threat to deep state power. Trump is a threat to administrative state power. Trump is a threat to the professional managerial class having a monopoly on so many institutions of influence in America. And so the and, and that's it's like I think the other thing that will be helpful with this election contest is hopefully people look at it. If the judges don't do as good a job as they could after they see and witness this hearing with live testimony and people will be shocked. My guess is they're going to hear very competent expert witnesses get up and explain how completely dysfunctional our election was. Not only that, they're going to put key high-ranking state officials on the stand and get to cross-examine them. Hopefully they do, they do a, a good job. The lawyer working with Carrie Lake on this is a lawyer who helped draft the Texas Supreme Court petition on the 2020 election. Uh, by the way, as soon as he did that, his law firm kicked him out. So, you know, well, that's the that's the sad reality of the practice of law in America right yeah. now. But the and you see a lot of the corruption and the collusion that's taking place on that side of the aisle. But I agree, it, it's a great step in the right direction, even yeah. if it isn't the full step that we ultimately need. And it, one issue that the judge did not allow to go to trial that I would have loved to have seen to go to trial mm. was the Twitter issue. Because the Secretary of State who governed, who ran the election, and the judge, by the way, said that somehow anything she did was not election misconduct because she's not covered. It's like, how is the, the state official that's running the election not covered? Okay, whatever. Um, I get it. He doesn't want to go there because he knows that's radioactive. He knows Twitter's radioactive. He doesn't want trials on that, which is, you know, again, sad state of affairs and where our judiciary is these days. But at least there's some trial going forward. But the, uh, is that, uh, is her collusion with Twitter that Elon Musk has just been, I mean, the Twitter files are really extraordinary. It's what some of us said we thought was happening. It's what some of us accused people of happening. We were called conspiracy theorists and called every other name in the book. And now it's even worse than some of us thought. They were meeting on, they actually gave, here, the President of the United States is subject to a raid of his home and potential criminal prosecution for having documents merely labeled and marked classified, while the Justice Department was handing out national security clearances like they were candy at a Christmas party for the members of Twitter 
so that they would comply with to, with the FBI's goal to massively interfere in the 2020 election by suppressing and censoring information concerning the Biden family corruption. And it's it's it, it, that, that's just one piece of and the and the feds were paying them. They're paying Twitter and paying these other people to do this. Uh, so, you know, Robert Kennedy's great suit pending before the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, where he said, look, the government is up to massive censorship and suppression. Uh, as Bobby Kennedy said, by the way, this past week, when Tucker Carlson said the CIA was clearly complicit in the assassination of his uncle, President John Kennedy, uh, he publicly said that, that that was a coup against our government for which we have never fully been able to recover. Uh, so he's an anti-deep state guy going way back, as he's publicly mm -hmm. said he believes the deep state CIA and others were involved in the assassination of not only his uncle John as president, but his, but his father, Robert Kennedy senior. Um, and so the, and he's continued that fight in his free speech fights against Fauci and the rest, but he spotted this quickly. He says this is everything. All this censorship is the sign of deep state manipulation is a sign of CIA complicity. Uh, you, you look at the CIA and big pharma, you look at these, these ties go deep, these ties go long, these type type ties, you know, MK ultra was not just a, was not just a, a, uh, a rogue CIA program to try to brainwash people and experiment on Americans without their knowledge. It was in bed to a certain degree with a certain, uh, uh, ideology that they share with big pharma in terms of how they treat people. Uh, as guinea pigs rather than as people needing uh, actual effective recovery. So, you, but with the, the Twitter stuff exposes everything that Bobby Kennedy's suit in the Ninth Circuit said was happening, uh, that, that it's even worse than Trump. Now, of course, it looks bad kind of for Trump that his own FBI was doing this to him. It shows how little institutional control he had. His own Federal Bureau of Investigation was suppressing information about the Biden invest investigation and demanding the big tech also suppress information about Biden family corruption in order to facilitate uh, uh, Trump's defeat uh, in 2020. I mean, they were waved, the FBI just waged open war with them like we haven't seen since uh, the Kennedy brothers uh, tried to take on political power. And so the, uh, but it's still amazing. I mean, that this is deep, the degree of complicity in with the FBI had, the FBI was orchestrating it. I mean, there's now not much doubt. And we're probably going to find the same thing out in the COVID files, that the Fauci and the Department of Health and Human Services and, 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 and uh, the FDA and CDC were coordinating the complete suppression of independent information and were using big tech as their gatekeeper control over the public narrative. And it, 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 the degree of it, the scale of it, meeting daily, meeting weekly, giving out security clearances, paying people off, threatening people with investigations if they didn't play ball. That also came out. Devin Nunes and his staff was subject to illicit subpoenas by the by Rosenstein and others at the Justice Department to try to prevent them investigating the FBI's corruption on Russiagate and Spygate. So uh, these ex disclosures have been extraordinary. And, of course, what's the EU's big concern? They're concerned that Elon's not going to censor enough, and so they're, gonna, they're talking about going after him for it. So, uh, but credit to Elon Musk, these are not all the way up to Assange levels, but of the type of disclosures that Julian Assange brought to the world. He's done the world a great service. Musk also put out maybe a Musk that, that both Assange and Snowden should be pardoned, uh, that, you know, his poll results support that. So that he's one of the mm. first high profile people in his position to come out for Julian Assange. So credit to Elon Musk. These are some of the most extraordinary disclosures of corruption in our government that we have known in the recent era. Absolutely. Right. Well, lots there, Robert, but can I just start going right back to the early points about, you know, electoral, the, 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 the cases about elections, which is, of course, when people tell you, you know, you mustn't really argue about these things because it's going to undermine people's trust and you've got to do it all very quickly. Two things to say. Firstly, these are laws. There are actually laws. <laughs> At the end of the day, the point of courts is to administer the law. It's not to, you know, uh, uh, do anything else than that. I mean, administer the law in order to achieve a just outcome. Look, courts come along and say, well, you know, we're in too much of a hurry. We can't going to do everything very quickly. It has to be done very fast. We can't look at all of these things. Well, because, you know, there's all these problems. So, well, what they're doing is they're not administering the law. And anybody who urges 
courts and says this is the right thing for courts to be doing because of these trust issues and because we have to get this thing sorted out quickly. Well, what they're actually doing is they're actually saying that the courts, sorry, that the laws of the individual states, the electoral laws of the individual states of the United States, they don't really matter because at the end of the day, you can write whatever you like, you can have whatever rules you want. But if you find that there are problems, well, you're, the courts are not going to worry about that because it's much more important to m maintain the appearance of integrity and to make sure that by a certain particular date, somebody is there who is the representative, the senator, the governor, whatever it is, um, of, of that particular place. Now, that is, that, that's, that's utterly wrong. It is, in effect, the demolition of law. It deconstructs law. And on the subject of, you know, sometimes you have to wait, you know, for the court proceedings. And sometimes that means that election results can be reversed and people who maybe thought they'd been elected aren't elected anymore and have to stand down and there's a new election and things of that kind. Well, I am not an expert on electoral law in Britain, but I am sure that has happened in Britain. I'm sure we've had litigation like that that's gone on for months, probably years. Um, if you, I suspect there's ample evidence. And I seem to remember such cases happening myself within my own lifetime. So I just wanted to make those particular points. That's there's my views. But I, I think that they're fairly straightforward points, but I would like to make them. Coming on to Twitter, there's one thing that Robert said with which I'm going to actually push back. He said this is not on Assange levels. I think it is every bit as bad as anything Assange disclosed. Now, Assange is not looking uh, the internal decision making processes within the United States. He never had that kind of access or not to any great degree. He didn't actually say, you know, find out what was being discussed within, you know, the Department of Defense or the CIA or anything like that. He found their machinery. He found the kind of things that they did, you know, Vault 7 at the uh, at the level of the CIA. They, he found that they had all these all these tools there. And he found some of the bad things that were going on within Hillary Clinton's campaign and the kind of way that they were organizing things, which is also very bad. But what we now have is something really extraordinary. What we have is a situation where the agencies of the United States, the federal agencies of the United States, particularly those that are concerned with the administration of justice, never forget that. Justice Department, fe the Federal Bureau of Investigation is under, comes under the Justice Department, that they are interfering in the political process. And they are doing so through the veil of a third party. They're applying censorship because that's essentially what they're doing. They're controlling the political narrative. They're making sure that certain topics get discussed in an election and others don't. And they all do that in order to achieve a certain objective. Now, when that happens, that goes to the root of democracy itself. That is something people need to understand. It's not any longer a democratic system where such a thing becomes regularized. This is a system which is no longer functioning as a democracy anymore. It's essentially become a conspiratorial system where a group of powerful insiders, some of them are part of the permanent state, deep state if you like, are in effect acting in a way to select the candidates and are shaping the national political conversation. So I would say these Twitter revelations are extraordinarily important, at least as important as anything that Assange has provided. They may not have the drama, but when you think about what they mean, when you think about their implications, that Twitter and the FBI were meeting, talking, discussing things that the FBI was paying people, as Robert said. I mean, it is absolutely astonishing, and it should show to the American people how um, endangered 
their republic has become. And the priority, it seems to me, for the new Congress that meets on the 3rd of January, as I understand it, um, having resolved the problems of who is to be its speaker, ought to be to undertake proper investigations to find out how this has happened, to make sure it doesn't happen again. And that means bringing the people who were involved in this to account. That's my own view. Absolutely. And I think and I hope that we, what we need and what we have needed for a while is another church committee. And we need somebody that is of that inclined to head that committee. And that's what I'm hoping the Republicans in the House do. And maybe these holdouts will leverage their influence if it doesn't lead to Trump being speaker for a period of time, which I think could have comparable public policy benefits. Uh, some, you know, do meaningful uh, committees with the right people, because what happened is, uh, for those that don't know the history, Frank Church created the first select committee on intelligence. And it was the church committee formed after Watergate that outed MK Ultra, that outed the assassination plots, that outed the illicit interventions by the CIA, that outed the attempts to, uh, the, including investigations into the Kennedy, uh, both Kennedy and, the, and Martin Luther King assassinations, that, uh, that, uh, that developed, uh, that show the complicity of the FBI with the Ku Klux Klan, that a lot of their informants were actually facilitating and enabling racial violence. Uh, that that outed the COINTELPRO program. I mean, that was partially outed by the great work by the uh, uh, by the burglars up in Media, Pennsylvania, but it was also further facilitated and broadly published by the congressional investigative committees. What happened was the intelligence committee, like all agencies, it goes back to my old debate with Ralph Nader, uh, my uh, friend and uh, former client which was my view was that all agencies inevitably become captured by those they're trying to regulate just due to the nature of the agency, the professional managerial class monopoly on power, uh, and the economic incentives. In other words, if you're at the FDA and you screw over the American people, nobody's really going to do anything about it. If you screw over a big drug company, they're going to make your administrative and bureaucratic life living hell. They have the political capital and the direct incentive and the, and the institutional awareness and knowledge to make your uh, bureaucratic and governmental employment future very difficult. Not only that, when you leave, ain't none of them hiring you for nothing. On the other hand, if you play ball with big, big, big pharma, they will protect you in Congress. They will protect you in getting promoted. They will protect you when you leave by giving you sweet gigs. That's why one of Trump's proposals was to ban uh, federal employees from working for big tech for at least seven years after they leave government. Because what people didn't realize is what, what, what's long been the case in the defense industry, as McGregor, God bless him, he just he, he's outing everybody on a daily basis. He goes, you know, you get, he goes, you get a lot, like, the, why is there some random colonel over in Ukraine? He's like, ah, you got a bunch of these war guys that can't wait to war game and go fight some war someplace. Uh, and he said, that, you know, the rest of them are just begging to get a paycheck when they leave to work for the defense industry. Uh, and he goes, that's why they're out there propagating utter gibberish and nonsense right on national TV. Uh, same thing in the big pharma context. You, you go go and look at where all these FDA people end up after they leave. It's all for big pharma. Uh, you know, that, that's where they get their payoff. We don't bribe people in advance in America. We bribe them after the fact. Um, you know, members of Congress, same deal. You play ball. What happens? You leave. You get a sweet lobbying gig. You get some other gig. I mean. Why is the political capital of the United States the wealthiest part of the United States and one of the wealthiest parts of the world? The political capital. What do they create? What do they produce? What goods and services do they provide when they're not ravaging and raping? I mean, you know, they, they, there is there is no value to uh, what they provide. And yet they're one of the wealthiest areas. This is why. Where we're like Rome and at the, the beginning of the decline of the great Roman Empire. Uh, Paul Kennedy, his book was kind of right. Uh, my professor at Yale back in the early 1990s, who said America looks like Rome, a parasitic political capital with a cultural disconnect from the rest of the population that's economically surviving off of debt and inflated currencies, that's uh, deriving its power from an overextended military bases around the globe that ultimately will collapse and implode on itself. And that's what we've been witnessing to some degree. So the uh, but I agree. I agree. With the, the disclosures have been extraordinary. Uh, Elon Musk far exceeded my expectation. I thought Musk was mostly doing this to protect himself. 
that the Biden administration had targeted him for some reason. So he was looking for political capital amongst conservatives. So he's going to buy Twitter and restore free speech. It turns out he wanted to out a lot of the deep state operations. And, and again, Musk is a guy that people viewed skeptically. Whitney Webb, other people, understandably so, because of how deeply connected he is to various aspects of deep state apparatus. But somebody tried, tried to screw over a billionaire, and it turned out, you know, uh, he had FU money and he's decided to use it. So the, because uh, these are, in, uh, this proves the validity of Musk's mm. supporters and fans that because this is, as you know, this is extraordinary disclosures. I mean, this was the government. It, we, we, you know, we found out about Operation Mockingbird 20 years after the fact where the CIA was uh, deliberately manipulating media coverage, placing its reporters and play. I and mean, that's still the case. I mean, there's still CIA agents working on news publications. You can watch the movie Spy Game, right, where they're like, oh, don't go after that guy. Uh, the he's he's actually MI6's boy in Hong Kong, right? You know, I, mean, I love the way they planted these little things in the movie, uh, in some of these films, these truths, these deeper truths. But to see it almost in live time, just two years after it happened, I mean, and of course the guy had to be named Elvis or something crazy like that. And I mean, just you know, uh, the, the 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 parody of parodies keeps coming true in in our current political reality. But yeah, I mean, I mean, and in his deposition taken in the Louisiana case. He disclosed a, a bunch of all, uh, additional more information. So you look at between that depth and, and we don't even know the scale yet. As you note, uh, Alexander, if the Republicans have either brains or balls and frequently they have neither. But if they have either, uh, then they will uh, if, if they're not just uh, gender identity performers in terms of conservatives who want to do something meaningful uh, and will be uh, con consistent to their base or just in their long term political self-interest. Ex create a committee that investigates all of big tech collusion with the government, uh, all of it with the CIA, whether it's the Defense Department, whether it's the FBI, whether it's foreign policy, whether it's domestic policy, whether it's Trump, no matter where it is to do another church committee, because what, what happened after church set up his committee is that the intelligence community co-opted those committees. And now our intelligence committees in the House and the tent in the Senate tend to be actually the intel community's way of controlling Congress and the public. And when they go AWOL, like Devin Nunes, they subject him to investigation. And I mean, Nunes was like a anti-Russia hawk, all that stuff. He just re recognized that their war on the, on Trump was bogus. The, but that's what we need. And, and what was you, what has YouTube been up to? I mean, take for example, as one of the super chatters and commenters noted, the, you, you contrast the, uh, the way in which YouTube promotes certain things about Ukraine. Right. So something like infographics, I think it's called, or all these like generic channels, Caspian Sea, and a range of these channels that are promoted heavily by YouTube to give you honest information about history and honest information about mm. geopolitics and mm. honest information about war have been propagandizing some of the most ludicrous nonsense that I, even the New York Times would be embarrassed to actually publish. I mean, didn't stop him from this past week telling us that Russia's humiliated and, and has a complete disaster in the war and all this other stuff, which we can get to in a bit. But like, if I go to YouTube, I'll get the craziest nonsense from channels I used to follow just because they had interesting little 15 minute videos about some, you know, like what happened in Atlantis, you know, that kind of thing. Right. You know, the different so stuff like that. Well, what happened in some, you know, Kings and Generals, another channel. They have been promoting and propagating some of the most preposterous claims about Ukraine on a uh, scale. The question is, is that part of the government operation? How much of that is the product of government collusion and coercion in mm -hmm. the big tech space uh, to collude in such a way to, to sponsor complete uh, com Operation Mockingbird in live time? Yes. So we need you're absolutely right. We need a meaningful, thorough comprehensive complete congressional mm -hmm. committee investigation to uh, uh just like this election contest we need a little more transparency we need a little more sunlight to disinfect mm -hmm. the diseased parts of the deep state absolutely and if we have robert robert alexander can i ask you both a, a, a quick question yeah. Yeah, yeah what do you make of uh musk and starlink since you mentioned uh, big tech of the ukraine war? I mean, what are your thoughts on on that to both about I'm, I'm, I'm also trying to work that out try to figure out is there an angle <laughs> I What's mean, I get all here? the critics like Whitney Webb and others of, of, of Elon Musk. I understand that because I was a skeptic. I got friends that are big investors that have been lifelong believers that love the guy that swear by him. And to their credit, I mean, they've been lining their pockets being right for the, at least for the last 10 years. 
So it's like, I, and I've always thought Musk was a master marketer. I thought he actually puts Trump to shame in his ability mm. to market. He's proven mm. that with how he's manipulated Twitter mm. uh, and managed it. But, uh, and the, the, the biggest issue is so much of Musk's money comes from government ties or government support or government subsidies or government sympathies. That's part problem. That's issue one that people have, whether it's China or the United States government. I mean, his electric vehicle business in substantial part makes money because of tax credits, for example. Uh, whether it could have sustained itself without that, big question. Uh, the government buys a lot of his electric vehicles. Uh, you know, the so they're a big provider, big purveyor. Uh, this, these are people, the re same reason people are skeptical of like a Peter Thiel. I think Peter Thiel's a real deal. I've met him. I understand where his mindset is coming from, but they're like, oh, he has Palantir. Palantir's tied into a bunch of Defense Department IRS contract. I get the concerns. Uh, as well, the and I and I was also the other concern I had with Musk was all the uh, what well, second as you note Starlink uh, and, and all the space stuff. SpaceX has deep, 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 deep government ties. A lot of Defense Department ties. Russia has long suspected Starlink is as a is a government uh, is a Western deep state operation to be able to extend surveillance and provide certain technologies uh, uh, in a selective way to promote insurgent causes. That was only enhanced by what by Starlink's initial utility in Ukraine. Um, I think that Musk was happy to play ball with all with everybody, and something happened. And it'd be like the Biden administration to push too far. So you know, there's over a thousand lawsuits that Musk faces. The SEC has been harassing him for over a decade. Some would say legitimately, others would say illegitimately. You could take your side on that. I'm not an SEC fan, so. Uh, very, very rarely I'll take the SEC side. I mean, they promoted FTX after all, uh, and the commissioner is friends with certain people at, at, at FTX, et cetera. Little, a little word of the wise, if you're, if you're awarded by the U.S. government for any reason, don't hang out in a country that has an extradition treaty with the United States. Just, 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 that's not going to work out well. The, uh, but that, that's another story for another day. The, so I think uh, to, to, to get to your core, the concern about Musk is legit. I think somewhere along the way, they threatened him too much, and he decided, screw you. And I initially thought the screw you was just going to be limited to opening up Twitter, getting buying, purchasing some political protection on the political right, because he already had some on the left because of his tech issues and environmental issues. But he clearly needed a lot more on the right because the threats were coming from neoliberals. Uh, and that doesn't surprise me. They're so arrogant, so condescending. It, it's why people can't understand why would the Biden administration be adverse to China when the Biden administration has so many ties to ask, well, frankly, a lot of corruption ties <laughs> to, to aspects of China? Uh, it's, it's because of an arrogant colonialist mindset that 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 sees China as their factory worker. And if China sticks its head up, they're going to slap them down. Um, and, you know, it'll be inconsistent and selective and all of that because of how compromised they are for a range of reasons and how much globalists want China as their factory worker, and so on and so forth, uh, and how much people like Bill Gates uh, love the control mechanisms that the Chinese government uses. And But like George Soros, if you stick your head up, they're going to try to smack you down in the way George Soros has done to any of his ideological adversaries over the years. Um, and he saw Xi as part of that, which is an interesting article, by the way, I think in First Things, or, uh, about the Chinese conservative intellectual tradition that's Currently, uh, that's an interesting article for those that are interested in, in the ideological implications of the piece about how Dugan and China overlap in certain ways with the American political right. Disagree on other place, but overlap in others. It's a really intriguing article uh, and it will expose why George Soros so fiercely opposes that regime, that thought and mindset in China. But I think so. Uh, and then you have, you know, the transhumanism and you got the whole I'm going to be king of Mars. You know, you, you, you got all the kids from all the different. You know, so a lot of those things were red flag warnings. I just think they pushed a billionaire too far and he decided I'm going to counter and I'm going to counter effectively and I'm going to use Twitter to expose them all to remind mm -hmm. them I, I'm not the guy you target. I'm not the guy you come mm -hmm. after. Mm -hmm. I'll play ball, but I won't capitulate. That's not yeah. who I am. Very independent minded guy. He always has been his whole life, whatever you think of him. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think concerns about Musk are legit. But somebody, it's classic with this yeah. Biden administration, as you guys have been saying, this is the most incompetent. Uh, aside from what you think of ideolo ideological issues or any particular, yeah. whether it's China, Ukraine, anything else, 
these people are just plain stupid. There, there's no getting around it. That that they, they they fell down the, the 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 dumb tree and hit every single branch, and that's what we're witnessing in live time. And I think they they just misread Musk. And yeah. you know you got to be careful. I mean, honestly, it's like, it was like when Obama mocked Trump in two, uh, after 2012 uh, at that uh, big uh, press get together. And it's like the moment he did that, he guaranteed Donald John Trump was going to run for president. Yeah, that 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 was that that was one of the biggest myths. But oh, he's so arrogant, so condescending, couldn't help himself. The arrogant condescension of the deep state neoliberals, I think, is what led to this back backlash by uh, Elon Musk. And in that sense, it's historical. Like, why was there a church committee? Because the first person the NSA put under illegal surveillance in the United States that was a major political figure was one young Senator Frank Church from Idaho. Yeah, exactly. I remember the church committee very well. I remember how it dominated the news, a lot of the news cycle for much of the United States. And it did an awful lot of good. And the reason we know about what the CIA is and what a lot of the things that it did do, uh, not just the CIA, obviously, was because of the church commission. commission. I mean, we have it, it, it radically changed our understanding of the way in which the deep state in the United States operated. And it looked as if it had been a great breakthrough. It had changed everything. Things would never go back to being as they were. And then gradually, slowly, ever so slowly, at some point in the 90s, perhaps, perhaps the 2000s, who knows exactly when, we were, we were, we were back not just to where we were when the you know, Church Commission came along and looked up, looked through everything. We were probably in some ways even worse than we were then at least that's what i think because this kind of interference that's going on in domestic american politics cia was interfering in politics in domestic politics in all sorts of countries around the world all the time and you know if you lived in greece as i did obviously as a child you were aware of it i mean you know it, it was not something that anybody had any doubts about but the extent to which we now see quite open interference by these agencies in domestic American politics, that is extraordinary. That is that is shocking. And um, yes, I've seen some people say that the deep state has always existed in the United States, at least the modern United States, never quite on this scale, never with so much power, and perhaps never quite so brazenly. And that's something always to remember. I mean, you know, perhaps it did interfere before. But it was careful, much more careful, to cover its traces because it knew it had to. Now it doesn't even bother. And why is it not able? Why does it not bother? Because it's got the media on side, it's got the political class on side, it's got social media on side. And that's why Twitter, that the Twitter revelations are so important because they show that the reason it has Twitter on side is not just because the people who ran Twitter are sympathetic to it, which you know, they, some of them were, but because there's actually a symbiosis. There's a symbiotic relationship between them and the agencies of the deep state. And in my opinion, you can't really separate them anymore. And that may have legal implications if it ever becomes accepted, but that's my view. Now, why is Elon Musk doing all the things that he is doing? I completely agree with Robert on this. I mean, I've you know, being involved in cases, I've seen when people start behaving, something has happened which has made him very angry indeed. And I'm going to guess that it is something related to Ukraine. <laughs> I think that is where it went wrong. I think, you know, he created Starlink. Um, I remember years ago, Russians, I, I, there's a, you can actually find it somewhere on YouTube. There's actually a film of a Russian scientist who is, you know, job it is to track US satellites. And he's saying, we're doing this, we're doing this all extremely well. We've got all this technology, we've got all these computers, but Elon Musk is going to come along. He's going to flood the place with all these little, little satellites. That's going to make tracking an absolute nightmare. The Americans are trying to swamp us, and this is a real danger. And, you know, this is before Starlink was really, you know, underway, and you could already see the Russians worried about this. But something happened with Starlink. Something happened over Ukraine. He was pushed into doing something he didn't want to do. He perhaps 
was getting on the receiving end of something from the Russians. I don't know. But something happened and he said enough. And he probably had discussions about this with all sorts of people. And he was slapped down and that made him very, very angry. And at that point, he said enough's enough. I'm going to start uh, I'm going to start telling people things about the things that, that, that are really going on. That's my guess, actually. Uh, I can't prove it, but look at some of Musk's own comments about Ukraine. And you see how clearly angry he is. And there is something must have happened to make him angry in that way. Yeah, it's the constant excesses of this yeah. uh, of of the. Yeah. It, I mean, it really strikes me about uh, it's so analogous to declining empires, the way in which the Biden administration operates. Uh, my friend Michael Malice has a new book out called White Pill. For those who want it, I think it's in the top five, selling well. The uh, one of the proudest uh, uh, anarchists uh, still in the United States, and a funny, funny guy. The uh, but he said early on that he loved the election of Biden because it damned the, the machine and the system more than anything possibly could, because you now have a dementia candidate as your president. You, you couldn't have a better sign that the empire is falling apart when the emperors are nuts. Um, and this is, you know, that, that, that we've seen that again and again and again with their excesses, because to your point, I mean, M Musk started off early on, pro you know, bragging about Starlink access to Ukraine. And then something happened because then all of a sudden he started raising questions about maybe there should be a peace deal. Maybe we shouldn't really be that involved. Maybe the Ukrainian should actually pay me or the Defense Department should pay me for all this work I'm doing. Clearly something got him going and he reversed course. Also that he, you know, at the beginning of all this, he didn't of the Ukraine conflict. He didn't have any hostility to the Biden administration or anything else publicly. He wasn't talking about buying Twitter. And then midway through, he does. So it's clearly something somewhere, someplace happened. Uh, and it wouldn't surprise me at all if it, w it was the gift that keeps on giving the Zelensky curse that now has political turmoil in Croatia. I think it sacked the government effectively. I think of Sl Slovakia. I mean, governments just keep falling one after the other. In Sweden, the conservatives might get, uh, uh, oh, no, maybe it's Norway, may, uh, may get uh, one of the most biggest conservative edges in over 100 years, according to recent public opinion surveys of future elections. Uh, the Tories are in a complete falling apart disaster. Uh, in the UK continually with no sign of that being reversed anytime soon. And so the, which is a warning sign to the establishment Republicans here in America, if they pay attention to it, the, so yeah, I, I, I do something happened, but whatever it is, it's been a blessing for those of us that uh, are opposed to deep state politics and opposed to the corruption and collusion and the censorship and uh, taking place at the big tech level. Uh, some of Trump's policy proposals are good on that, on that side of the aisle. But it's like someone asked me the other day, they're like, they had never witnessed in live time the degree of discrepancy between the New York Times and the mainstream media and the uh, allied places on YouTube, Twitter and social media and big tech supported in terms of the mainstream narrative in the West about Russia. And they like they like when they're saying when I watch the Duran and other aligned uh, or redacted or, or McGregor or any of these places, I get one view and it's radically opposite what The New York Times is telling me, what The mm. Wall Street Journal is telling me, what Rupert Murdoch's media empire mm. is telling me, what YouTube is telling me, what Twitter is telling me, what the U.S. government seems to be saying. And someone's asking, can both realities exist or is this two ships passing in the night? And it's it like it's you're just. If you go back in time, this is not uncommon. I mean, all the propaganda during war is uh, often been utterly gibberish and nonsense. It's not exposed as such until many years later. Um, and the, I mean, that's where you have an example of this is why they hate Alex Jones. Alex Jones is a live time critic of institutional deep state priorities and is usually one of the first people. He was the first person to out Bill Gates connected to the COVID issues. One of the first people to out that where this was going in terms of the pandemic politics and policy. Well, uh, one of the first people to crit criticize pretty much every war the U.S. has got involved in um, and, and, and unraveled some of the agenda behind it. His book, The Great Reset, sold very well. It's the reason why people like Sebastian Gorka, who's really a fake populist. And I mean, but, and it's fascinating. This connects to uh, uh, the U.K., Alexander. So you look at Gorka and he's like the opposite of, say, say someone like George Samueli. 
So uh, George Samueli's father, his grandfather, uncle, other people were famous involved in the communist revolution in Hungary. You know, uh, flee, uh, go to the UK, be, be, but become dissident intellectuals in the UK. Uh, if you look at Gorka, Gorka also uh, flees in, 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 in Hungary, goes to the UK. But, you know, while he's studying philosophy and some other stuff, all of a sudden he shows up in the uh, British Military Intelligence Army Reserves. And it's because he's one of these ex-Cold War guys mm -hmm. that uh, uh, that speaks multiple languages, which was useful mm -hmm. for things like interrogations and subversion, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden he shows up as a defense guy uh, in, in the uh, uh, Hungarian government. Uh, and people are like, uh, what exactly, how exactly did this happen? How did this guy that's in philosophy uh, suddenly get uh, a defense connected ties back in Hungary from, from just from familial ties? And he was going to be appointed to a high rank. And what it was is he was going after the, uh, uh, the then Hungarian, quote unquote, left, trying to expose them as communists, the secret communists. And they, he got outed because they, they wouldn't give him a national security clearance because they dug in and they're like, mm. this guy's got British spy tattooed on his forehead. So and then all of a sudden he becomes an expert on 9-11. He becomes an expert on terrorism. It's like, well, well what's his background? And suddenly, but all you need to look at it was who was promoting him. Who was claiming he was an expert on terrorism? And, and what is it? It's all these NGOs and front groups for the defense establishment and the deep state uh, apparatus when you extend the deep state to the West writ large. He ultimately gets run out of Hungary, comes back to the United States, where, again, he's getting, like, defense deals and, I mean, I mean working for institutes that are connected to the defense industry. And it's like, how did this guy get all these protections and connections? Then he hooks up, uh, and then he begins to propagate what is there was a legitimate concern by the right, but what was happening was the deep state wanted to take mm -hmm. the uh, ideology of of radical Islam and present it as identical to communism, with the goal being now we can recreate another Cold War, justify all of our mass surveillance, justify all of our military spending by saying that we face a threat as equal or maybe worse than the ideology of communism in its politicized, radicalized Islam. Now, there was legitimate concern amongst the American political right who was identifying a strain of thought in, in, around the world that, that did present a threat in that regard, but nowhere on the scale and it didn't explain things writ large. Like, I mean, in the same sense that anti-communism was often used as a pretext to cover up suppression of just peasant movements or labor movements or worker movements or democratic movements or human rights movements around the globe to such a degree that Nelson Mandela was a secret commie all along, all that kind of stuff. Um, the They were going to use anti-radical anti Islam to do the same that everywhere and every place there was a problem, somehow it's connected to politicized, radicalized Islam, that some disputes about really geopolitical power were being recast as, as, as that. But he gets promoted like that in the West and through it in the United States and becomes national security advisor at, the, at Breitbart. He parlays that into a brief gig with the Trump administration. Now, something happens in the security clearance investigation that doesn't clear him. Uh, and so he ends up leaving uh, the, uh, the the Trump administration same time Steve Bannon does. Someone asked earlier about asking Bannon about some of these ties. I, I've said uh, uh, I'm friends with Bannon. I've uh, uh, invited him to sidebar and other places. He hasn't accepted yet. So we'll, we'll see. I got a lot of questions for Steve. I like Steve. Big fan of Steve. I think he's a brilliant architect of populist thought and anti-establishment thought in America. Uh, at the same time, he's made some tactical errors that have been very uh, – unhelpful so the uh but and i'd like to ask him a range of those questions but we'll, we'll see if that if steve get, comes along with that down the road but the you look at gorka is a classic example of how the deep state operates and who is one of the first people once gorka's outside it, like not only is gorka promoting the ukrainian conflict and and jesus Zelensky, uh he i mean he's just a pure war whore which exposed who he was and is but he's obsessed with bashing people like Alex Jones on a constant, yeah. continuous basis. And it's uh, and I always say those things are the cues and clues to who these people really are. Uh, and you dig deeper and that's what you get. And, and that's just the surface of deep state corruption and collusion in our, uh, our academies, our big tech social media guardians, uh, our universities, uh, our academies and the political sphere.
Absolutely. You get all of these extraordinary people who rise up, get into all kinds of important positions, become important publicists, are presented to us as experts. And then you go into their background and it's very difficult to see where this expertise comes from because they don't seem to have the kind of background that would qualify them as experts. But experts is what they're called and experts is how they're treated. And everybody else who's not an expert is pushed, by this definition, is pushed to the sidelines, even though they may be saying things that are absolutely correct and true. Can I just say a few things about some of the things that you were talking about, uh, Robert? I mean, you talk about the fact that there has never been a greater disconnection between the sort of things that you'll find on channels like this, that you ran, what you'll find in mainstream New York Times type media, which is absolutely true. And it's been so on topic after topic. But what I say about this is who turns out to be right? Who was it who said right from the very first moment when Russiagate began before the election, you know, before the 2016 election, we were saying, all three of us, we were saying this thing that there's some sort of great Russian conspiracy in which Donald Trump is involved to make him president is absolute nonsense. We were saying that, not the New York Times. <laughs> the New York Times is still mainstream. Perhaps we're not. But if you want to compare who is telling the realities, we were telling the realities. And you're talking about Ukraine, which is the big topic today. Well, there's been this really extraordinary, revelatory series of interviews in, of all places, The Economist. And there is enormous debate and discussion and argument, I know, about why these interviews have been allowed and have happened in The Economist, of all places. I mean, this is, you know, the neocon central thing. But you see these Ukrainian generals, and they're coming along, and they're basically saying, if we don't get impossibly, impossible shopping lists of weapons we're going to lose because that's basically what they're saying and they're not just saying that they're saying you know that the russian mobilization succeeded that they don't actually have the problems with morale that people are saying the you know on the russian side that you know that the russians are a real threat it, it completely contradicts again the version of events that you get in the New York Times, and this is the Ukraine's own top commanders were saying these things, and it corroborates what all of us, all three of us have been saying on our various programs. So, you know, if you want to follow, you know, look at who's got the better record. We don't always get it right. We can't. Nobody does. That's not humanly possible. We don't always get it right. But look at who's got the better record of getting things more right. Well, we are. And maybe Gorka is considered the expert, but look at how many things he's got wrong. <laughs> oh, I mean, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, I think... Mm. Uh... Yeah, Ukraine's been on the naughty list, not the nice list. So I don't think mm. Santa's bringing him a bunch of gifts for Christmas uh, of the kind of weapons list that they would like. Um, though the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Victor Boot, uh, you know, it, you know, maybe they need to reemploy uh, Victor uh, to be able to uh, to facilitate those kind of exchanges. But you look at it's uh, what reading the New York Times the last couple of days, it has been stri over the last week. The, the, I, I don't know exactly what the motivation is of uh, uh, other than trying to motivate members of Congress to write one more big check to Ukraine, because otherwise, like they're actually, you know, rebutting and contradicting their own story, own reporting over the past three or four months, because there's been sporadic reporting by The New York Times that things are not like the West has otherwise presented it as, that Ukraine is actually in trouble, and places like Bakhmut is just a Ukrainian bloodbath, blood that the, the Russian mindset is just, mentality is just fine, Putin's not going anywhere, Russian economy is stable, uh, the sanctions and economic war failed, you have, the, you have MBS in Saudi Arabia arranging his deals with Xi in China, creating a further alliance, deepening alliance with uh, Putin in Russia. So that uh, all these things suggest, I mean, they had the, the recent vote in the United Nations where they said, should we have a new order uh, different than the old Western order? 
in pretty much every country outside of the West or the West sphere of influence, like, say, Japan or Australia or New Zealand, all voted for a new order, uh, all voted for what Putin was talking about, not what Biden has been talking about. And so, I mean, I mean, we're so desperate that we're trying to let MBS off or hacking up that journalist in Turkey. Uh, so that, you know, we had to dismiss and disallow any claim to be brought in the United States uh, as partial capitulation to try to get MBS back on the U.S. train on certain issues of either defense spending or uh, or oil pricing. And so it, it, it which is directly contradicted the earlier Biden regime. Uh, you, you look at all of these dynamics. Everything says Putin is doing just fine. Russia is doing just fine. And yet you have these two several days of the New York Times presuming the opposite. I mean, saying, how did Russia get it so wrong? How did how did Russia lose so badly? Uh, you know, how how is it Putin just doesn't understand things? And when I was reading through it, it reminded me of what's been really recurrent in the West coverage of mm. Ukraine, mm. which is in Ukraine's own policy announcements, uh, which is confession through projection, uh, mm. which is an old theory of mine, which is, if somebody accuses you of something really weird and out of the blue, assume the accusation isn't about you. Assume they're confessing their own crimes. You know, Edgar Allan Poe's The Telltale Heart Beats Loudly. People have this need to confess. And I, I've seen it in a wide range of legal and other contexts. And that has really been true of this war. So it's like if you substituted in Biden wherever they put Putin, in the United States wherever they put Russia, you got a very interesting confession you know, overstating their own influence, understating their adversary, uh, misreading circumstances, being locked into a bubble, not getting uh, accurate, adequate, consistent information. This long uh, uh, having troops uh, lose, uh, you know, the lose in terms of mindset with the uh, domestic population, lose in terms of massive levels of people deserting. I mean, why is a Ukrainian uh, general talking about increased penalties for people who desert if it's you if it's Russia that has the desertion problem rather than mm -hmm. Ukraine uh, but it was stunning reading those New York Times pieces again I think it's just the deep state's stenographer to try to get a big check written before the new house comes in uh, in January because Kevin McCarthy has signaled there is inadequate support within his Republican base to give any more money to Ukraine so mm. they're trying to get this passed in what's called a lame duck Congress uh, uh, to to get this done before the new house comes in. And I think that's why you got these this utter gibberish. It's just going to be embarrassing. It's going to be Stalin isn't causing any famine levels embarrassing for the New York Times, say, three years or five years from now, because its reporting was just absurd. And again, I just tell people, read the articles, do confession through projection. You'll actually find the United yeah. States confessing to how they got Ukraine wrong. It's absolutely correct what you say about confession through projection. Um, I, I, I've, in, I've encountered it myself. I mean, I've had to speak to people. <laughs> you see it in the witness box sometimes, which is quite quite bizarre as well, um, as I'm sure you have. Uh, I'm sure you have seen, Robert. But um, I mean, the point about the administration—it's um, not just incompetent; it's also dangerous. It's dangerously incompetent. It is dangerous about the way it's administering U.S. foreign policy, because, yes, all right, you can assert you can be a administration that wants to assert U.S. interests. You can be very aggressive about that. You can do things which I would not personally approve of. I'm no particularly I'm somebody who takes a very realist line. I think that people should states should try and work together as states, not as, you know, amorphous. EU type entities, but anyway, never that's another discussion. But you know, that they should work together as states, they should avoid confrontation. But I accept, you know, there's some people who will take a different view. They do everything badly, and they don't just do it badly in foreign policy, but they do it in a way that's now got to the point where no one trusts them. Even the Europeans are getting fed up with them. The Europeans are now complaining about the way in which Biden and the administration has taken them for a ride, that Europe's suffering all the economic consequences, the US is reaping all the economic gains, they're stealing, I mean, there's, there's people like Robert Habeck in Germany and the French finance minister complaining that the US is um, 
deindustrializing Europe. And is that what you want your allies to be saying at this time? Couldn't you have worked this in a somewhat different way if projecting US power was really your objective? I'm not letting the Europeans off here, by the way, not in any way. But I mean, we see the Chinese now complaining that the administration lies to them. Xi Jinping has said this directly to Biden. I read the Chinese readout. It was quite extraordinary to see. I had a we I did a program on the Duran with Ray McGovern. Um, it was talking about how Putin felt eventually that the point had come where Biden was lying to him too. And that was one of the reasons why trust completely collapsed. The point is you can come along and you can say to to Putin, look, we're going to, we, we don't care what you think about Ukraine. We're going to go ahead. We're going to go and push all the way in Ukraine. We're going to make Ukraine one day a part of NATO. And he would have been furious. There might have been a war, but there wouldn't have been this total collapse of trust, which now makes negotiation, eventual negotiation between the United States and the Russians, negotiations between the Ru United States and the Chinese, negotiations between the United States and everybody, so difficult, um, at least so long as this administration is there. And it's not just incompetent, it's dangerous, because you see that always we drift into the most confrontational policies, and they are equally confrontational within the United States itself. The language the administration comes up with in talking about its political opponents is of a sort that I have never seen any other administration in American history use. And we've discussed this in previous programs, the way they play fast and loose with the law and the Constitution of the United States, again, is something that I have never seen in my life. And it's both dangerous and, as I said, it's incompetent at the same time. Yeah, it's extraordinary. Also, the continuous intervention, 1950s, 1960s style, by this administration in Latin America and trying in parts of Africa recently. Mm -hmm. But, like, you look at uh, Argentina and you have the overt weaponization of the legal system against the prior left regime, and maybe there's legitimacy there, maybe there isn't. But at least the Argent large share of the Argentinian public does it believes it's political weaponization by the court process against the uh, former leaders. You have Peru, which has been a place of dis instability now for a better part of a decade. Uh, many there's an increasing number of migrants that are coming across the border in the United States illegally are coming actually from places like Peru uh, because of the uh, various instability there. And there you have a leftist president come in. Now, maybe he was corrupt, maybe he wasn't, maybe, but whatever happens, he tries to escalate uh, in one way, and they escalate by not only removing him, but arresting him. And then you see CIA types with the U.S. ambassador and others meeting with the new president who, was ne who wasn't elected anything. And now all of a sudden you have mass protest in Peru, particularly amongst the indigenous population and elsewhere. And it starts to feel like everything starts to feel more and more like the 1970s all over again. Not only do we have stagflation in the United States, uh, not only do we have a sort of incompetent administration in Washington, but just without the ethical probity of people like Jimmy Carter, um, but we're seeing instability around the globe, attempts to escalate conflict in Eastern Europe, and, and things going on in Latin America. And, and then you have Brazil, where you have the military and the courts kind of at war with one another. It's not clear if that will escalate or not, but I thought the Brazilian courts were over the top in being critical of Bolsonaro's election challenge, like the U.S. courts have been. And, you know, they were going to fine him for even bringing the challenge. It's like, yeah, some weird things did happen in that election. And are they just inviting an overt, open, con and it's the same Brazilian Supreme Court that, you know, put Lula back in. Lula has longstanding uh, corrupt ties to the United States, including particularly the Clintons. I, there was a case that I was involved with that directly involved Lula's corruption. So I have no doubt he's corrupt. Now, I think he has some good policy instincts mixed in with some questionable ones. He didn't really govern as a leftist. He governed as a centrist. So we'll see what happens the second time around. But you see this global instability and frequently U.S. fingerprints somewhere connected to it. 
uh, because there was talk that the Biden administration, you know, really didn't like Bolsonaro, so brought pressure on the Brazilian uh, political apparatus to help get Lula released so that he could run and challenge him. You've got allegations that they became hostile to the Argentinian regime and are greenlighting what's taking place there. Uh, allegations that they were part of what some people see as a coup in Peru, um, and the uh, and that and then you've got. Uh, arrest of various leaders in uh, our former leaders in places like Honduras and in the Caribbean that are uh, the uh, that have hasn't gone well reported in the United States. But it's usually the drugs is usually the pretext. But it's not clear that's the real reason. That's a pretty rare reason, frankly, for the U.S. to be concerned uh, is is a former politicians drug ties when you know arguably that that started <laughs> with, with us in the first place. Um, so, you know, what exactly is going on? What are your thoughts on like Peru, Argentina, Central Latin? I mean, I'm concerned about the increasing instability the Biden regime appears to be reaping there. Absolutely. It is creating increasing instability. What I can say, by the way, about drugs since this is given that there's been <coughs> drugs found in British houses uh, where the Conservative Party has been doing its things. Maybe, maybe they should send some of their people to carry out arrests here. That's all I can say. Anyway, never mind. Let, let's let's move on. But absolutely, I mean, you know, what goes on in these countries is the business of these countries. The Kirchners um, have been politically powerful and important in Argentina for a very long time. Peru, as you absolutely rightly say, has had a history of instability. Brazil is getting increasingly unstable as well. These are all countries with a background of violence. I mean, you know, I can remember times, I'm sure you can remember times, Robert, when, you know, Buenos Aires, there was terrorist movements very active there. Peru, there was, you know, there was a civil war for a while, you know, with Sendero Luminoso, a most frightening organization. And of course, Brazil, um, well, they had a tremendous crisis in the 60s there was a coup there was um very fierce repression and of course they've had a law and order problem and you know that's never really resolved itself so the united states or let's not call it the united states actually let's say the administration blunders in and it decides to come along and it's taking sides in these quarrels now i don't know about argentina but it's quite clear to me that they've taken sides both in Peru and in Brazil. And these are big countries. They're important countries. And it's not like the United States of the 1950s, which had enormous power, enormous power over Latin America. This could very easily blow up. And if it blows up in a place like Brazil, well, then God help us, frankly. It's exactly what the United States should not be doing. If you get an outcome in an election in Brazil that you don't like, if you get a Bolsonaro, well, you work with him. You find ways to. He's not anti-American after all. <laughs> I mean, you, you can find ways to work with Bolsonaro. You might not think very much of Biden. Who does? That's the other thing about Biden. I mean, and I, I really want to say this. I mean, if you look around internationally, apart from in Europe, nobody no likes, him. likes him. Nobody no likes him. him anywhere. He's not liked in Africa. He's not liked in the Middle East. <laughs> MBS can't stand him. Pretty much doesn't conceal it. Modi doesn't think much of him. Xi Jinping tells him, you're lying to me. We've seen what's happened with Putin. Nobody likes Biden. But all right, you can still find some way to work with people, someone like Bolsonaro, who clearly has a lot more support in Brazilian society than the mainstream media in the West or in the United States, in Britain, made you think. And you deal with that. You accept that and then you find ways to work with it. And you usually can if you prepare to meet people halfway. But of course, they don't. They go back to the old tricks that they had in the 1950s, except that they don't work anymore. It's like an old actor that you know just goes on playing the same role even after long after they've lost the skill to do it. And this comes back to our earlier discussion, because to the extent that this is an administration, which is an offspring of the deep state, after all, would it have got elected were it not for the fact that there were certain interventions in the last election, like pressure to restrict a story on the part of the New York Post? 
agitation to do things on Twitter, all of those sort of things. Perhaps we should not be surprised that the administration is allow is repeating, in effect, the same playbook that the deep state itself used to play long ago, and it points to decay. You again, you talked about you know the fall of the empire, the the fact that empires fall. If you look at one of the reasons why empires fall is that they just don't adjust to the changes around them. The United States in its heyday, incredibly dynamic society, it adjusted all the time. It was constantly shifting its foreign policy as things changed. If you study American history carefully and properly, you will see that. So you have periods of relative isolation, periods of relative engagement. And of course, the more powerful they got, the more they were able to shape their environment, the international global environment. And usually, by the way, before the world wars, they did it in a peaceful way. I'm not saying they always did. I'm not saying they always acted well. Sometimes they didn't act well. But the fact is, they were nimble. They knew what they were doing. Whereas what we have now is, again, end of empire policies. We do the same thing that we did 50 years ago. You know, 50 years ago, we were able to carry out coups very effectively in Brazil and Argentina and all those places. And it worked and it worked very well for us. So let's try and do the same thing all over again. You know, those countries may have changed completely. We may have changed completely. Our power may not be what it was, but we don't want to accept that. We want to go on pretending that we are exactly where we were in the 1950s, because that's what the deep state is that's what we that's in our genes if you like and we can't think and we can't change and we can't find our way a way to to look at the world as it's changing as well yeah i mean what they've done is what we've exported but we've now imported because you look at the kind of craziness of criminalization of politics in places like argentina and brazil that we're seeing resurface at a major level bolivia before that with evo morales that had you know had to escape the, the country uh, while he was president, that uh, you know, now we're doing the U.S. where we're mm-hmm. trying to criminalize the political opposition and going after Donald Trump. Uh, they, they may they, they may indict him. Uh, you know, politically, they can just look at the recent example of Netanyahu. How well did that work out? Uh, the indictment of Netanyahu just led to Netanyahu coming back with even more political support than he's had in a while uh, because the Israelis can't figure out how to manage their. Uh, their government without Netanyahu, uh, it appears, in the past decade or so. And the uh, so I, I think there's a risk of a Trump indictment because of the D.C. political corruption at the grand jury level, the judicial level, the jury trial level, that they're also political, they're also partisan, they're also Trump hating. They can't help themselves. I also think it's a guise to, I mean, here's the irony. The media is trying to convince everybody Trump can't win. Trump will be the weakest Republican candidate. Smart Republicans need to get rid of Trump. Put DeSantis in instead. It's like, well, if they really believe that, they wouldn't be trying to indict him. They wouldn't be trying to pass congressional legislation that says he's banned from presidential office, uh, which I don't think is constitutional, what they're trying to do, by the way. But they, they wouldn't be doing all of those things. There wouldn't be this constant harassment, this constant uh, legal weaponized system against him. The uh, So... Uh, Now, I think as to DeSantis, I've gone back and forth. I think DeSantis has been a very good governor, but the reason there is reason for skepticism among some in the Trump world, particularly uh, those opposed to deep state politics, opposed to war, opposed to bad foreign policy decisions that we've been talking about, because DeSantis has the fingerprints of a recruited candidate. So DeSantis came from working middle class stock in uh, Florida. Then he gets a scholarship, uh, I think, to Yale undergrad, if I recall right. It's either Yale undergrad and Harvard Law or vice versa. But that's there's not a lot of people who get that. Uh, I was a scholarship student at Yale myself, but then left in protest because they were trying to exclude other poor students. The uh, but so he goes from Yale then to Harvard Law, and then it, the next step is where people were kind of curious, is that he gets re- uh, goes into the military. And he gets uh, recruited early on and placed at Guantanamo. 
there are stories circulating about exactly what his role was in Guantanamo. But I can just say it was at Guantanamo during the 9-11 era. So do the math of what probability that there are think ghosts and skeletons lurking from that place. Uh, then he gets assigned as legal counsel to the Navy SEALs in Fallujah. So that's a very unusual track for a working class kid from North, from middle Florida. So just saying the, I mean, everything about him screams recruited candidate. Now my view about, and then when he was in Congress, he was aligned with the neocon Tom Cotton, was uh, preaching anti-Ukraine, was one of the congressmen who signed a demand to support the Maidan coup, um, uh, was, of course, very pro-Israel, and and then took traditional Republican positions on issues like Venezuela or Cuba. There, because he's from Florida, I don't, you know, begrudge him. I don't make that as a big determination one way or the other. If you're from Florida, you're a Republican, you're going to be pro-Israel, anti-Venezuela under Hugo Chavez and Maduro, and anti-Cuba uh, 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 under Castro and the communist regime. That's just political reality there aren't a bunch of pro castro votes in florida there just aren't uh aren't a bunch of pro maduro votes uh in in florida either from the venezuelans that have shown up there about half of one percent of the total vote now uh so the my thought process but as governor he has been much more of a populist inclination put in a florida surgeon general that's been the most critical of the fda of big pharma of the vaccines uh, petitioning a grand jury, a statewide grand jury, to criminally investigate Big Pharma, uh, attacked the World Economic Forum and its general agenda, attacked Bill Gates and its agenda, refu- you know, ultimately was one of the first governors to push back against lockdowns, push back against mandates, whether they were mask mandates or vaccine mandates, opened up the schools, critical of sort of woke idolatry and ideology being taught to little kids, took on the Disney Corporation, which was unheard of in Florida. My view is that uh, DeSantis is a pragmatist. I used to describe George Wallace as this. So George Corley Wallace's sins were not the sins of racism, but the sins of a politician. That he actually had a very diverse history. People forget he stayed in power as governor of Alabama with the support of black voters after 1974. Uh, you know, but how did George Corley Wallace manage that? Well, he's a great politician. George Corley Wallace didn't start off as a racist. He started off aligned with uh, th- this book is about big mules and branch heads, the great big Jim Folsom, great old populist governor in the middle of the civil rights movement in the 1950s, invited Harlem Congressman Adam Clayton Powell down to the Al- Alabama state capitol and gave him a, a very public, high profile embrace. Uh, he started, Wallace started out as a Folsomite, and then he lost because people accused him of being soft on communism and a race. And he said, well, I'm never going to let that happen again. And then he shifted to racist and and military had the unfortunate uh, choice of putting a uh, crazy LeMay on the ticket. And it's always fascinating. You watch the old press conferences of George Curley Wallace trying to explain that no LeMay doesn't really want to nuke the world. Yeah. LeMay did really want to nuke the world. He thought we got it. Hey, we got a nuke edge. You know, I mean, Le- Le- LeMay is basically kind of George C. Scott's character in Dr. Strangelove uh, was the guy smoking cigars at John F. Kennedy's autopsy uh, likely involved and complicit in that was a, he was the guy who firebombed the hell out of Tokyo uh, and was deeply proud of it. I mean, he was part of that military generation, which McGregor is saying there's residual versions of that in our current Pentagon who imagine and fan it, you know, who, but at least LeMay had some reason for his inflated ego. It was World War II and the success against the Germans and the Japanese. So there was at least some understanding of where that militaristic mindset came from. But he thought, well, as long as we have a nuke edge, we should use it against Russia. He wanted a nuclear war. But you got George Corley Wallace being the reasonable one saying, no, 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 he doesn't really want to nuke nuke everybody. He didn't mean it that way. Yeah, 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 he did. But, you know, and later in his life, he became a left, uh, uh, kind of a left populist, Democratic populist, brought, put together the coalition of working class whites and black voters in Alabama because, again, he's a pragmatist. I think uh, DeSantis is ultimately a pragmatist. I think his working class upbringing gives him a unique opportunity to challenge and contest deep state power. And it was after that World Economic Forum, anti-World Economic Forum speech that suddenly people started saying DeSantis against Trump. And the reason for that is you wouldn't do that if you actually supported DeSantis. You would only do that if you wanted to undermine both DeSantis and Trump at the same time. Trump arguably took the bait on some things, but that's Trump because he's going to be Trump. Uh, It's like doing the advertising for trading cards. You know, he he, he can't help himself. God bless him. Now, by the way, that made tons of money. He made like four million bucks in 24 hours. And and those cards are worth a lot more money. Only Trump could pull that off. 
the, uh, <laughs> but I think what's really happening is the deep state is trying to set up discredit both DeSantis and Trump, making them appear to be opposed to one another. There's mm -hmm. a bunch of fake polls out there, but like reliable polls, like the Harris poll being done by Harvard, uh, which has a consistent, more consistent methodology, shows Trump with a huge lead over DeSantis. The reason for that is they're tracking working class votes. These polls that people are seeing with DeSantis with this big lead is because there's a massive class gap within the Republican Party. If you're upper middle class, professional degree, part of the managerial class, live in an upscale suburb, you're for, and you're a Republican, you're for DeSantis. If you're pretty much anybody else, you're for Trump. If you're a black Republican, you're for Trump. If you're a Latino Republican, you're for Trump. If you're Cuban, you're Venezuelan, you're Mexican, Mexican American, Puerto Rican Republican, you're voting for Trump. If you're a white working class or middle class or entrepreneur or business oriented individual, you're voting Trump. So Trump has not lost. People can ignore all those polls out there that say DeSantis has a big lead. Doesn't, it's not true. Those are polls that inflate the upscale portion of the Republican vote. There is reason for concerns with DeSantis, but all the people I've talked to said DeSantis, he's a pragmatist. He's never going to challenge Trump. He knows if he challenges Trump, even if he wins, a group of Trump voters will never vote for him. And it means his political future is done. He's DOA. He knows this better than anybody. Whatever his sins are, what is true of him without doubt is that he's a pragmatist. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. he has great potential based on his governorship, based on his working class roots, despite the fact that he has the fingerprints of deep state recruitment. They may have just misgaged who he is, uh, that, that in terms of his background, his biography and his profile and yeah. propensities. But the goal is to create a fake fight between DeSantis and Trump to discredit both so that the other candidates who are who have been trying to run Pence, Pompeo and Haley, the three favorites of the neocon deep state. They got Pence as the religious candidate, uh, Pompeo as the national security candidate, Haley as, oh, she's an Indian woman candidate. You know, so it's it's how the deep state tends to recruit candidates. They're, they want one of those three to be the Republican nominee in 2024. They don't want DeSantis because they don't trust him based on his governance of Florida and his high, especially, I mean, Big Farm and the deep state have been in bed together for a very, very long time. Uh, it wasn't just the Nazis that came up with the idea of bringing in the pharmaceutical industry into helping propagate the war machine by drugging up their own soldiers so their blitzkrieg could last 48 hours straight. There's a reason why those Germans were, you know, being able to not sleep. You know, you put enough drugs in their system. Of course, it doesn't work over time, as the Brits found out when pilots started falling out of the sky from having too much drugs in their system. But there's a long time ties there. And the fact that DeSantis is willing to try to use a Florida state grand jury to expose the scale and severity and scope of big farmer corruption. I mean, I have the big whistleblower case for Brooke Jackson against Pfizer. Uh, that uh, that Pfizer is doing everything possible to hide discovery and get the federal judge to not let us facilitate, not let us pursue discovery in the case, which unfortunately the, the judge has gone along with so far. They're accustomed to carte blanche power. They're accustomed to deference from institutions of authority. The Biden Justice Department has tried to stop that case from going forward, even though they were supp they're supposed to be. I mean, they're, they're screwing over the American taxpayer in the tune of billions of dollars by undermining Brooke Jackson's whistleblower case because they care more about covering up the corruption involving big farm and the government than anything else. The fact that DeSantis is willing to bring a petition to the state, to a statewide grand jury that would allow them to criminally investigate. And there is no immunity from that under the various federal laws that exist in America uh, is extraordinary. So I think DeSantis is still on a populist path. That's not going to challenge or contest Trump. People are right to demand <laughs> that he revoke some of his, former foreign policy positions. But to his credit, he's mostly avoided saying anything on the Ukraine or any other place, in, despite coercive efforts to get him to do so. And again, the deep state clearly has soured on him because otherwise they wouldn't be putting him up as the lead candidate against Trump, knowing it damages him amongst Trump supporters. It means they don't want him to run uh, and or don't want him to win or hold office. They want either Pompeo, who that's why Tucker in part went after him on the CIA and the Kennedy assassination, yeah. just to remind everybody who Pompeo really is. They yeah. want uh, to go after, they want Haley, Pompeo, or Pence. That's why Pence had that sweetheart book deal. That's how you launder political bribes in America. You give people huge amounts of money for books you know are not going to sell that way with royalties. I mean, the the idea that you, you'd get $2 million, $4 million, $8 million for a book, what? I mean, come on. 
I have to say, my impression of DeSantis is that he is an extremely clever man. He's managed to do very, very well in Florida. And if he was an ideological neocon, then he's behaving completely unlike an ideologic, every other ideological neocon I know, because mostly they can't stop talking. <laughs> I mean, that's one of the things about neocons. They are extremely voluble and vocal and, in fact, aggressive about how they talk about their beliefs on foreign policy. So the fact that DeSantis doesn't talk about foreign policy, that strongly suggests to me that he's not a neocon, actually. He might have said neocon things in the past. He probably was an evolving can candidate at some points. But, you know, I, I, you, know you probably know more about this than I do, Robert. But, I mean, I, I think that if you go back into the early political careers of the Kennedys, Kennedy brothers, John and Robert, I mean, they said things, some things in the 50s, and they were very different from what they actually did when they came to office in the 60s. And that's what you should really look at, what people do, not what they might have said at an early stage in their career. So I'm not actually particularly concerned about DeSantis. I think that this whole Trump versus DeSantis thing, it looks completely unreal to me. It's clearly been promoted by people, especially, I have to say, um, establishment McConnell-type conservatives who are out to cause trouble uh, for Trump. And I, I just don't take it very seriously. Cause trouble for Trump, cause trouble for DeSantis as well. By the way, I saw a very interesting article in the American Conservative, I think it was, which basically said exactly, made exactly the points about the midterms that you were making in um, when we had our previous program and made it very clear that in its opinion, the opinion of the person who wrote it, the major reason why there wasn't a big Republican breakthrough in the Senate and some other places where there might have been, quite apart from the many structural problems that we've talked about many times on these programs, which the importance of which should never be underestimated, was because of the way in which the establishment, the Republican establishment, supported some candidates against others and in fact worked to undermine some candidates who should have won. And, you know, you provided, you provided some of the figures. These people, the person who wrote this article provided some of the other figures. It shows you the kind of pressures that exist within the Republican Party and why, on top of everything else, America not only has a problem of a deep state, of a Democratic Party, which seems to have sold its soul, because that's what it's done. I mean, I remember the Democratic Party as it was, and looking at what it's become. But also Republican Party, which is divided within itself. Only one suspects that the people in control at the Senate level is a small group, relatively small group of people, and that the Republican base overall is very, very much bigger, and that this group is becoming increasingly isolated. Now, one of the things this article said is that the fact that 10 Republican senators voted against McConnell is actually a very big deal, and that he's probably likely, this is probably his last Congress in which he's going to remain Senate Majority Leader. The fact that 10, as many as 10 senators came out and voted against him, where before it would have been unthinkable for anybody to do that, is a, is a sign that his authority is um, draining away. Oh, yeah. And, and I think m my suspicion about McConnell for quite some time mm. is that he plans on stepping down early. So there's a Kentucky governor's race in 2023. If a Republican wins, I believe he intends to get that governor to appoint his agreed successor. And those McConnell will handpick his successor. And in exchange, McConnell will step down and give that successor a three year head start on reelection. And so I think the last, with the 2023, my prediction will be is the last year Mitch McConnell's in the United States Senate. Now, his successors are unfortunately equally uh, suspect. So you have uh, John Thune uh, from, I mean, the Dakotas, no less, which has a long history of populist Republicans, but he doesn't look anything like such a populist Republican. He was the dim-witted 
uh, a senator who proposed and floated the idea of cutting Social Security benefits during the runoff election for uh, uh, in Georgia, which obviously didn't help Walker any uh, to remind the working class uh, independent vote that remains skeptical of the Republican Party. Justifiably so. The, I mean, there really is a distinct, if the other reason why any Republican other than Trump has, in my view, little prospect of success in 2024, despite Biden's obvious problems, is the working class, non-evangelical Christian vote. So the Republican Party built its majority prior to Trump, primarily on its base being made up of uh, evangelical voters, particularly white evangelical voters. The problem from a presidential perspective is that the electoral college, in the electoral college, white evangelical voters are underrepresented. In other words, they're so concentrated in certain states, like certain parts of the prairie Midwest and the Southeast, they're underrepresented in places like Pennsylvania and Michigan and uh, Wisconsin and Iowa uh, and and then out west in Arizona, Nevada. And so the uh, uh, indeed, that's why they used to call the Electoral College the Democratic Blue Wall, that they and that is because those states had underrepresentation of evangelicals, white evangelicals compared to the Democratic base. Trump reversed all that, though he did it just instinctually. Trump has always had uh, dating to the time when his father had him work as a teenager on the construction sites has always related easier to your your working class New Yorker. Than he does anybody else. He said this famously on Larry King about 20 years ago, said it to other people 30 years ago. He says, if I ever run for office, my candidate won't be the Park Avenue. Can- my, my voter won't be the Park Avenue voter. It'll be the working man. Um, and so, but what the advantage is from an electoral college perspective for the U.S. presidential election is working class, non-evangelical uh, voters are overrepresented in the industri- in the electoral college, especially the industrial Midwest and the Southwest, and so like Nevada, for example, has an underrepresentation of upper middle class professional degree voters, an overrepresentation of uh, working class voters, some of whom are Asian and Mexican American, uh, but also uh, white voters from the Midwest and the Southwest, especially. Same to some same in Arizona, same in uh, Wisconsin, same in Pennsylvania, same in Iowa, same in Ohio. People forget that before Trump, all of those states, Ohio, Iowa, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Nevada, not Arizona. Arizona has been its own animal. But those six states have been more Democratic than the national average in almost every presidential election pre-Trump in the modern era. And so Trump reversed that. I mean, these are people who voted more for Dukakis than the national average, voted more for John Kerry in 04 than the national average, so on and so forth, and voted more for Obama in 2012 than the national average. It, the, the, uh, originally, the Democratic Party was paranoid of a popular vote. Now they're trying to push through a popular vote proposal. They didn't used to because in the pre-Trump era, they were worried about losing the popular vote from a PR perspective uh, because of their electoral college edge. So that means you need a voter that appeals to that working class independent voter who's driven by trade, driven, as has been shown in a range of studies, by war. Like disproportionately, Trump exceeded uh, the Democratic norm, uh, outperformed Republican past in counties that had a disproportionate number of deaths related to foreign wars. So that over the prior two decades. So that anti-war voter, particularly say you're a Norwegian voter in places like Western Wisconsin, uh, your rural small town working class voter. Like I'll give Pennsylvania as an example. Trump ran substantially four, five, six points ahead of the Demo- of a Republican norm in Pennsylvania. But he ran double digits behind Romney in Pittsburgh and the P- in Philadelphia suburbs. How did he do it? Well, the whole rest of the state trended even more for Trump, and that's two-thirds of the vote. Uh, same in Wisconsin, same in part- substantial parts of Michigan. Same in Ohio. It's why Ohio became uncompetitive for Democrats. Same in Iowa, which also became uncompetitive for Democrats. All both senators, all four congressmen, now Republicans. Uh, Same in Nevada, which he was shifted from a Democratic state to a competitive state. Uh, But what this last election shows is that a lot of those voters won't vote for a traditional Republican. Uh, You know, they'll even vote for, you know, a a mental case uh, like uh, the, the, the case in Pennsylvania than an establishment-oriented Republican they don't trust. 
and they they still see the Republican party. They remember the Bush branded Republican party. Kind of like it's what's happening to the Tories in the UK. It's very analogous that if you shift back to that Bush branded style republicanism, elite school style republicanism. I, I think in the UK the public schools are actually the private what we call private schools, vice versa, which throws me off always. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's that elite school mindset. And we're seeing that the Brits blew their post-Brexit opportunity of having those working class Midlanders uh, support and embrace them and are now shifting, looking at third parties, independent parties, et cetera. Rather than, and, and America's future without Trump on the Republican side will look more like what the Reform Party is showing of the split of the split in the UK than of uh, Bush branded Republicanism coming back to presidential power. And so the uh, I think that's why it's really that's why Democrats are still so paranoid of Trump. That's why they want to indict him. That's why they want to pass legislation that purport, purportedly prohibits him from running. That's why they're propagating polls like the USDA, like the USA Today, saying, oh, uh, you know, nobody in the Republican Party wants Trump anymore. That's why you're seeing all of those narratives. That's why when he proposes a big tech censorship policy proposals that limits the federal government, especially in what they can do. Uh, because of the legal loopholes that currently exist to prevent the FBI from doing what they just did in 2020, interfering in the election, uh, propagating war messages and other things by mislabeling foreign interference. What is really just domestic corruption is foreign interference. Um, that They're going to keep going after Trump. And uh, that's what they talked about his NFT proposal rather than that proposal, because they understand that Trump has a unique appeal to the working class independent voter, the equivalent of the British Midlander voter. Uh, that no other Republican has, mm -hmm. and that's their only real risk. And it's also the deep state fear that Trump will even will be much more anti deep state in a second term, much like John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy were turning towards in the middle of John Kennedy's term mm -hmm. uh, than he was first time around. Yeah, that's exactly right. I think the analogy, by the way, with the dynamics in Britain is a good one because though Britain and the United States are very different countries. We actually have the same phenomenon here, that the traditional party of working class voters in Britain was the Labour Party. After all, they created it. There was the, there was, uh, it, that's why it was called the Labour Party. It was created by the trade unions, which brought together British, predominantly must be said in terms of, you know, electoral weight, English working class voters. That was their vehicle. And if you went back, you know, 50, 60 years, if you'd seen the kind of people who represented the party in the House of Commons, um, they were very visibly from that background. They were very vis visibly working class people. They worked their way up trade unions. They'd been sponsored by their unions into the House of Commons, and they were devoted to their party, the Labour Party, and the working class in Britain was devoted to that party as well, which it saw as its party. Now, both parties, both the Conservative and Labour parties, have lost that, the support of that electoral demographic. Um, neither party really appeals to that demographic. And the person who's going to change British politics, who's going to break through, is the person who dis rediscovers that demographic, connects with it, and mobilizes it. And yes, we have Reform UK, we've had Farage. So, you know, Farage has been around for a long time. You know, he may, be, there are times, I have to say this, when he's looked a bit stale to me, but he's still a formidable force. But it seems to me it's exactly the same in the United States. Now, I think the relationship between working class America and the Democratic Party was never exactly the same. The working class didn't establish the Democratic Party. I think it has a much earlier roots going all the way back to the 19th century. But by the mid 20th century, it had a very similar connection in FDR's time. And the Democratic Party at one time in effect, represented these people, and then it lost them. And then we've had Trump bringing them to the Republican Party in large numbers because he's articulating the kind of things that once upon a time, populist Democrats or Democrats used to articulate, which they don't anymore. And 
the risk is, the problem is that just as you see with the Conservative Party now, there's this tug of war within the Conservative Party between its populist wing, which wants to hold on to working class voters who voted Conservative in 2019, but is resisted by the sort of patrician old guard. You're seeing the same thing happening on a much bigger scale, a much more important scale in the United States within the Republican Party. And I think, again, you're absolutely right. I think, Robert, it's going to it's going to be who wins that demographic, who wins electoral power in America and who's able to change and shape America, because I'm going to make a guess. It's probably still the majority. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, mm. it's it's basically you've you've had a situation. I call it the mm. problem of the professional managerial class. Mm. That since the early 20th century, the professional managerial class as a class, using credentialing, using licensure, using the acculturating experience of the American universities and academies, has co-opted control over so much of American society and power that you know they run the human resources and marketing departments at major corporations. It's sort of like a, a Gramsci's slow walk through the institutions. They have uh, taken over large aspects of Hollywood and cultural transmissions. They've professionalized journalism. Journalism was once a working class occupation, now no longer. Now they dominate who reports on the news, what news gets reported, how that news gets shaded, how that news gets shaped. They're the engineers who've taken over big tech as the gatekeeper of access to even independent information. What you see, what you don't see, what's promoted or uh, protected in the algorithm and what's pushed down and or even openly and overtly censored with the aid of the government. They've, But they've also taken over the political class. They uh, Not only in terms of the consultant class, all the advisors and the people who... That, that used to be a, like a old school working class kind of occupation in many respects. Uh, of people who work their ways up from the bottom of being of managing and advising candidates. No longer. Now this is a professional managerial class, most of whom lives in the District of Columbia or its suburbs, uh, who are promoted and protected by, by pushing the institutional narrative of the professional managerial class. So not only do they, by definition, dominate the judiciary, my view has been that I I'm for uh, a judicial branch that doesn't require licensed lawyers. That used to be the case, actually, in Tennessee in parts. You could be a judge without being a licensed lawyer. What did it produce? Some of the most interesting judges we ever got because they came at it from a totally independent, fresh perspective. They weren't limited by their life experience. I was uh, recently lectured by a, a federal judge in the Brooke Jackson case for making public comments about the case. <laughs> they even used like, my YouTube interviews and other things. The, uh, the, the, the judge's complaint was that was came from Pfizer. Pfizer complained and said, Oh, look, uh, Judge, uh, Mr. Barnes has called your decision on discovery a wuss decision, uh, which is kind of, you know, hearing a judge make the word wuss reference was kind of funny to me. I was like, oh, what world are we living in? But OK, the uh, uh, and, but the reality is most federal judges in the United States have limited life experience. They come from upper middle class backgrounds. That's how they're acculturated and they're raised. Then they go through the academy process, which acculturates them even further in a particular viewpoint of the world and particularly elevates the professional managerial class as a special class of experts who can uniquely guide and govern the rest of us. When, in fact, their very limited life experience makes them the least capable of doing so, in my opinion. Then they go through the credentialing and licensing process, and they use that to further acculturate them to a particular mindset. Then usually as lawyers, if you get to the federal bench, as a lawyer, you've proven your loyalty to the system. You usually work for corporations or the government or both. And you've usually reflected an attitude in your political preferences that suggest a deference to institutional powers and authority, to uh, whether, whether it's big corporations or the government, with only occasional and exceptional variants based usually on cultural ideology. Like the, the, the real dispute between the Republican and Democratic Party uh, over the past couple of decades, and uh, definitely since the Clintons, has been uh, basically, do you want big government to run your life or big corporations to run your life? And the only real other divide has been the divide between the religious conservatives and the seculars. So that, you know, you'll get justices that, judges and justices that care about religion, religious rights, that care about certain aspects of speech or governmental control as it impacts the fight between corporations uh, and the government or the administrative state and aspects of private enterprise. 
uh, but but you won't get meaningful issues contesting institutions of corrupted influence like the deep state that the courts are notoriously deferential to, that uh, other things like that. And y- your example, Alexander, of UK is perfect because you go back to the 1950s, you could see a similar thing in, in, in America. Most of our representatives in the, rep- in the representative class were actually relatively representative of the American public. They came from a wide range of social, economic, and occupational profiles. Like the Labor Party used to actually be made up of, in Parliament, of actual laborers who had grown up in the labor movement. Today, almost all there's almost no laborers that are in the, uh, in the UK Parliament on behalf of the Labor Party. In the United States, uh, you have over half of our members of Congress are come from the professional managerial class at some level. Many of them lawyers, some of them doctors, uh, and they and that creates a very limited mindset. You have this professional managerial class governing the rest of us, and we're seeing what happens when they have accumulated power. I mean, a large you could argue for those that support the idea of shared wealth and communism and so forth. Well, that was the it's the old anarchist Marx debate from the 1840s, where the anarchists were like, you can believe in communalism all you want. If you put a small group of people in power, they're going to distort the incentives for their own power. And ultimately, they'll arrogate it to themselves and you'll never achieve any utopia that you're talking about. Uh, Well, that that left anarchist criticism proved true. Why? Because the professional managerial class is who communism elevated to power. And we saw what that looked like when they had complete power whether it was Stalin, Stalin's Russia, or even post-Stalin's Russia, but definitely Stalin's Russia, uh, you look, or Mao's China, or Pol Pot's Cambodia, uh, or Ho Chi Minh's Vietnam, or uh, or to, to a lesser degree in some respects, in terms of humanitarian disaster, uh, Castro's Cuba. Uh, it you, you give this small group of professional managerial class all the power, it doesn't matter what you believe, conservatism, liberalism, communism, uh, uh, free enterprise, doesn't matter what you believe, it will get corrupted because they will corrupt it by irrigating power to themselves and they have too little life experience to make good decisions. And what you get are needless world wars. What you get are needless global depressions. What you get is what we are at the risk of facing today. Absolutely. Can I just ask what you make of this Trump indictment? I mean, I'm trying to work out what he's going to be indicted with. I've been reading the news reports here in Britain and um, every single report that I've read about what this committee has come up with. um, It doesn't seem to me that it amounts to anything. I mean, um, am I missing something? Is there something more substantial here? Or is this just something that's been conjured out of the air? I mean, so many things about Trump are always conjured up out of the air. But, you know, is there something substantial? I mean, can we have a case on this? It's completely third worldish, And we haven't seen an example of this at the federal level since World War One. So in World War One, you had people locked up for just being socialist. You had people locked up for uh, just uh, opposing World War One. You had people, and including congressmen and presidential candidates, like Victor Berger from Milwaukee and Eugene V. Debs. So we haven't seen, so there is a history of it. It's just, it's fortunately, we have seen for most of our history since then, we have seen that as a misuse and abuse of power, dating back to the Alien and Sedition Acts that Thomas Jefferson uh, overturned. So you look at the allegations and they don't amount to crimes. So you, Trump made a speech. Their main thing is, you know, it will be wild is the biggest quote they like to use. But that quote comes from weeks and weeks before January 6th. On January 6th, what he said was two things. He said, make sure to protest peacefully at the Capitol before anybody went down there. And then he tweeted out in tweets that Twitter deleted. So most much of the world forgot he said when there was talk of potential conflicts between Capitol Police and Capitol protesters, he tweeted out no violence. No, no illegality, respect the police, respect law enforcement. We respect the law, continue to be peaceful, don't be violent, on and on. Then he made a public statement to that effect from the Rose Garden. So the idea that Trump in any way uh, enabled, conspired to obstruct the proceeding, to trespass on the Capitol grounds, to uh, commit any kind of criminal behavior is just non-existent. If you compared it or contrasted it to, say, Kamala Harris, who was offering free bail money for people who were looting and burning down the city of Minneapolis, that's a lot closer to aiding and abetting criminal behavior than anything Trump did. 
Trump was just on the was actually to the opposite. Prior to it occurring, Trump wanted to have more security present throughout the Capitol, asked the mayor to <clears throat> allow more National Guard to be present, asked the FBI whether if that could happen. It was the mayor. It was Nancy Pelosi. It was Mitch McConnell. It was the seventh floor of the FBI that said nothing needed to happen, <clears throat> even though we now know that the uh, all these organizations that were involved in illicit activities on January 6th were infiltrated extraordinarily and pervasively by mm -hmm. informants and uh, agents of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Uh, mm -hmm. That the government knew weeks beforehand that there were some people talking about being disruptive on January 6th. And yet mm -hmm. they were they had extraordinary lapses in security on January 6th. Uh, turned down National Guard presence, didn't have certain things secure outside the facility, actually directed people towards the Capitol rather than behind the Capitol where the protest uh, petition had actually been granted. There were people taking action while Trump was still speaking, so it couldn't have been in response to Trump. In fact, what they did was counter to Trump's statements publicly. So they're, they're, the referral from the January 6th committee, as D and Dershowitz himself has questioned even the constitutionality of that action, but the uh, under the circumstances, due to problems with the, the way the January 6th committee was created, in part, uh, is that is obstruction, sedi sedition, insurrection, conspiracy. There's simply those grounds are groundless. Uh, so legally, grounds are not there. This is the this is the attempts to criminalize speech. This is the attempt to imprison dissidents. This is the attempt to to lock up and prohibit your leading opponent from running for office. Uh, and this is, you know, something we call dictatorial and anti-democratic anywhere else in the world because that's what it is. And abolish the and abolish the First Amendment to the Constitution along the way because <laughs> that's what this does. I mean, it seems to me that it criminalizes protest. I mean, even if you're completely wrong about the election, even if Trump was completely wrong about, let's allow the fact that he was completely wrong. Let's allow for the fact that it was the absolutely perfect, best managed, most perfectly administered election in history. He is entitled to a different view. <laughs> that is his right. And he has a right to express that view. That is also his right. And he has a right also to protest about what he may think is wrong. He may be completely wrong. And others have a right to join him in that protest. That is how free speech the protections in the Constitution, as I understand them, are supposed to operate. Uh, saying that, you know, well, this is forbidden and, you know, not allowed and, you know, this is all incitement and sedition and all of those sort of things. I mean, again, it's, it's, I mean, I, I, I just, I mean, I just left speechless again. I mean, I never imagined to see this sort of thing happen in America. If you'd asked me, could this happen in America six, seven years ago before Trump was elected? I would have said a committee like this would never be set up in these kind of circumstances. It would never make the kind of decision that it did. Making, setting up such a committee, making that kind of recommendation. And I, you know, I think Dershowitz, by the way, is probably right. I mean, who are these people to suggest that these kind of things be done? But I mean, isn't that a, a, a function of law uh, of the Justice Department of the federal agencies? But anyway, I'm never, I'm not going to go there. But doing all of that, it seems to me, it's not just wrong. It is incredibly dangerous, and it takes an axe to the first constitution, to the First Amendment, and indeed to the entire Constitution, the entire spirit of the Constitution of the United States. Robert, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish now. I've been talking a lot. I, Alex, I'm sure, has things to say, but perhaps if you want to just respond to that quickly and then we can ask, uh, we can bring Alex in. There's a move within the Republican Party along with the institute, mm -hmm. the establishment part of the Republican Party, people like Ryan Goderski, who goes around pretending to be a populist, mm -hmm. uh, and some other people like that. Uh, and then the, with it, to support the institutional narrative that challenging elections is somehow bad, that that's a sign of conspiracy thinking. That's a sign of undermining American democracy. That's a sign of something that's anti-American. But but, you know, Alexander Hamilton wanted to challenge a presidential election from the very beginning. Thomas Jefferson and John Adams participated in electoral contest issues concerning electoral college 
uh, issues when they were vice president and presided over the proceedings in both of those elections. Uh, electoral contests are as American as apple pie. It's the reason why we have election contest laws specifically to allow contesting an election. Barack Obama got elected to the state Senate in Illinois by challenging the signatures uh, whether they matched on his opposing candidates. Jimmy Carter got elected into one of his first offices by an election contest. So there's a uh, th th it's uh, and look at Democrats. When Nixon won in 68, they say they said he stole it because he, he interfered with the peace deals with vis-a-vis -vis, uh, his uh, Henry Kissinger in Vietnam. In 1972, when they won, they stole it because of his dirty tricks, alleged dirty tricks campaign. And when Reagan won in 80, they said he stole it because of the secret Iranian deal uh, of guns for hostages. When Poppy Bush won in 88, they said he stole it because of a racist Willie Horton ad campaign. When George W. Bush, they said he stole it in 2000, thanks to the U.S. Supreme Court. In 2004, they said he stole it because of the Diebold machines in Ohio. And when Trump won, they said he stole it because the Ruskies stole it for him. So it's not like Democrats have been uh, not contesting elections uh, very often. Stacey Abrams, famously in uh, Florida, in Georgia, continued to claim her, the election was stolen from her after the 2018 gubernatorial race that she lost. So uh, the contesting elections is American as apple pie. Democrats have done it actually far more often than Republicans. While Nixon believed Kennedy stole it in uh, from Illinois, uh, he didn't file an election contest or make much of it publicly. When Johnson won in 64, there was not as many Republican complaints. Same with Carter in 76. Uh, same to mostly the same degree to Clinton in 92 and 96. And for the most part, Obama in 08 and 2012. Whatever criticisms were raised were generally not of the stolen it category. So Democrats have been more culpable in that respect. But I think right completely within their rights. Indeed, there is evidence of a lot of that election interference occurring in uh in terms of Iran in 1980, in terms of uh, Vietnam in 1968, there actually was a dirty tricks campaign by Nixon mm -hmm. in 1972. George W. Bush did win it thanks to the U.S. Supreme Court and his brother being governor of Florida in 2000. There were some issues with machines in 2004 that Robert Kennedy and others have talked about in Ohio. Now, the one that was utterly made up, as you noted earlier, was the Russiagate allegation against Trump. Mm -hmm. Trump won fair and square, despite the massive monetary edge for the Clinton campaign, the me media effort for the Clinton campaign, and the FBI waging a secret war against Trump's campaign from the time of his apparent nomination all the way to election day, and how they handled a wide range of policies, including covering up Hillary Clinton's email scandals by not bringing any criminal prosecution against anybody, even uh, for issues of perjury and, and obstruction of justice, actual crimes. So the, the effort to export to import what we had previously exported and weaponizing legal systems to destabilize foreign governments around the world, importing third world politics that we had previously created in part to the United States is just an embarrassment to the Democratic Party and the American legal system. Mm -hmm. I'm still hopeful they will not cross that Rubicon of weaponizing a system against a former president that they've already crossed some little mini Rubicons and just raiding him in the first place and all the rest. But if they were to actually bring a bogus criminal indictment in a corrupted jurisdiction like the District of Columbia uh, against Trump, it will further uh, rally Trump supporters behind him. It won't lead to opposition to him. <clears throat> uh, constitutionally, he can run even if he's elected, even if he's uh, uh, arrested, indicted and convicted. The U.S. Constitution, as Eugene V. Debs previously proved, still allows him to be the candidate for the presidency of the United States despite that. Uh, so they can't prevent him from being on the ticket. They really can't prevent him from being a candidate. <clears throat> and I think it will be so open, overt, partisan weaponization of the legal process that it will lead to more backlash than benefits if they proceed. But they've shown no willingness and readiness to understand such backlash in the first place. And that's why we face the political reality we face, whether it's domestically, economically or in foreign policy around the globe. I completely agree. Yeah. Well, Alex? We're, well, we're at uh, about two hours and 20 minutes, so we should wrap it up. We're going to get to all the questions in a separate uh, video, so we'll answer all the questions as well. But um, just listening to everything that uh, you said, Robert and Alexander, we just kind of go back to the Twitter files and to the revelation that the FBI had a corner office at Twitter 
And they were working with Twitter to, to basically run the company, to censor people and, and to do all kinds of things. So I don't think it's that much of a stretch to say that the deep state and these intel agencies are doing the same thing with January 6th, with Trump DeSantis, with everything, with Ukraine, Russiagate. Yeah. I mean, that would be my assumption. If they're doing it at the scale of Twitter, then I'm sure they're doing it just about everywhere else. Yeah. Oh, no doubt. I mean, I mean, they were going, like what Taibi pointed out, uh, TB coming from kind of the anti-deep state left background, originally started off writing in Russia. Uh, I forget what the name of the outlaw, I forget what that publication was way back yeah, in the Alex day. The, the Exile. The, the Exile. exile. Yeah. Ah, I was close. I knew it was something like that. Now, you know, uh, he and Mark Ames, they wrote some interesting stuff. I mean, there's some stuff they probably, you know, might want to re-edit back in the past, but that's another story for another day. Uh, but the, but, you know, great report, credit to Musk for, for giving it uh, to Taibi. He realized Barry Weiss was a mistake after he gave it to Weiss. Uh, but Taibi was, uh, you know, really out at it. But one of the things he pointed out was they were obsessed with little accounts. That was their degree of censorship and suppression. They were worried about anybody with dissident information. Read like William Appleman Williams talking about how the State Department, Defense Department, military industry in the United States in the 1940s and 50s was more was obsessed with any counterexample, even if it was a tiny little place like, say, Cuba. They were more obsessed with suppressing those independence and freedom movements that could be embarrassing to institutional power in the United States as a counterexample, then they were like global policy at times. <clears throat> and the FBI, the same obsession, little tiny accounts with no, no followers. They want to nuke, nuke, nuke. So they were obsessed with dissident information cracking through uh, the to, to the ordinary person, which I think the upside to it, the white pill to it all, is they don't have to obsess with lying to us and suppressing and censoring information if they're not worried about the court of public opinion. It shows their the constant obsession with the deep state, from the, at least from America from the 1950s forward, with controlling and censoring and directing information, which we'd seen in previous examples in World War I, and Civil War, and other contexts, reveals that they understand the potential power of ordinary, everyday people to make a difference. So by continuing to support independent content creators, by going to places, by supporting the Duran, which you can do at multiple places, duran.locals.com, the merch shop, all those other places, sharing and subscribing and providing information, listening to the information, giving it to other people. People don't understand how radical and revolutionary that can be, how that can change things overnight, that the four pillars of power have a fifth pillar of power underneath it, which we used to teach foreign governments through the Einstein Institute and other organizations, which is that fifth pillar of power is the perception of the legitimacy of the other four pillars of power. Take out that fifth pillar of power, all the four institutions of power collapse. In the end, they're just a few people trying to govern all of us. And they're like that plantation owner who's constantly fearful the slaves might revolt some night. And so and they know information is the first key to that uh, revolt taking place and, and changing the world the way it's done. And it's how all revolts that have ever been successful have been done throughout political and America, uh, not only American history, but world history. So it's credit to ordinary people that. The, the, the fact that the FBI sits around and obsesses every day, what you, the audience, thinks, tells you it matters what you think and what you do about it. Well said. Well said. Robert, where can people support you? Where can they find you? Absolutely. So if you want uh, all of the uh, content that we provide over any platform, uh, well-organized and curated, or you want exclusive content, including hush-hush videos with alternative narratives about J. Edgar Hoover, what about January 6th, about mm -hmm. Kennedy or King assassinations or the Malcolm X assassination or any of the rest. Uh, or if you'd simply want to content, uh, uh, communicate, provide your own content, share your own posts, comment on those posts, be part of live chats and live dialogues and live streams. You can get all of that content at one place at vivabarneslaw.locals.com. And that link is in the description box down below, and it will also be a pinned comment as well. Thank you very, very much, the great Robert Barnes, Alexander Mercuris in London. Thank you to our moderators. Thank you to everyone that watched us on Rumble, Rockfin, Odyssey, YouTube, and the Duran.locals.com. Let's, uh, let's call it uh, a live stream. Great show, everybody. Thank you very much.